In the name of Almighty God, I invoke the light of Alpha and Omega, our Father, Mother, beloved Helios and Vesta, great central sun magnet, O mighty I am presence, light rays extending from the very center of cosmos to our own beating hearts, great miracle life, that is our appearing and our reappearing throughout all cosmic cycles. I call thee forth in the fullness of the violet flame for the transmutation of the many levels and layers of our mandala of light, of all souls who are a part of this life wave of Sanat Kumara, all of our incarnations together as we have forged and won our community of the Holy Spirit. We call this day for the penetration of the violet flame into the cycles of our history and the historical stream of God through which Yahweh, I am that I am Sanat Kumara, has appeared to us making known his will the evolution of his wisdom and the full flowering of his love. Lord God Almighty, thou who hast appeared to us within each other, within our hearts, within our right choices, within our courage, our humility and our boldness to stand for Christ. Reveal to us the deeper meaning of our experiences, how we can transmute each wrong and injustice how we can backtrack from the wrong turns in the road and mounting by the law of transcendence, the ever mounting spiral staircase of our life, enter into new joy and the resurrection of this community unto life everlasting, ultimately transcending these matter spheres as they are rolled up in a scroll as though they never were and yet we retain the fiery essence of the body and blood of Christ and the collective God consciousness that we have won in grace by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Maitreya Gautama Sanat Kumara. In the name of the entire spirit of the Great White Brotherhood, in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of the Mother, consecrate each one to ever new cycles of being, O Lord. O 
want you to be seated. Won't you sit back as much as you can in these benches? Relax and prepare to enjoy yourselves. Well, we are gathered here together today to accept El Moria's challenge to contemplate history and the historical cycles of our being. We have, since our weekend seminar last spring, been studying the incarnations of Lanello. And we are nowhere near through. And rather than skimp over them, we have taken our time to do more thorough research, have longer lectures, and really get into the whys and wherefores of these incarnations. I think that it is important to bear in mind that an historic dictation was given a year ago at this time at the Chicago Teaching Center from beloved Portia. And she said to us that a year from then, we would know exactly why it was so important that we secure the inner retreat. A year has gone by, and I can think of at least a dozen reasons why it was so very important for us to secure the inner retreat. She made another statement that was very important, equally important. She gave a lecture, a very fiery lecture, on the subject, you can transmute history. You can change history. We think that history is said and done and all over with and the page is turned and is it, it is as it is. But in actuality, you can send the violet flame into the past and actually transmute that which is unreal and see to it that that which stands as a memorial to the lives we have lived is truly the real. This involves transmutation not only of the personal self, but of everyone involved in the mandala of the scene. The scenes of past history, which center around the embodiments of Lanello, include all of us and many thousands more, and often millions upon millions more. Thinking about what Quan Yin said, as to the necessity of gaining a certain God mastery before we can balance karma with certain individuals, and then remembering that there is also group karma, and the entire group of the seed of Sanat Kumara has karma to balance, and also is on the receiving end of having debtors who also owe them karma. So we can understand that even though we may balance 100% of our karma, the amount of life waves involved in the situations of our karma means that the records of those events still exist, albeit outside of oneself. They exist in someone, and many times in millions of people, who still hold the records of the emotions, the opinions, the condemnation, the joy, the praise, and the whole gamut of human consciousness regarding those events. So we realize that it is a giant web, a web of karma that can become a web of light. And the Indian term for the web of light is the antakarana. So we are weaving an antakarana of cosmos that is like a spider's web. It is a vast blueprint of the galaxy in which we figure as the key coordinates of light. We have our galaxy, we have our community, and we are filling in the spaces and the intersection of lines of force. So one of the most important reasons in studying history and beginning with our center, our sun center of Mark Prophet, is for each one of us to also return to those scenes and our participation in them at some level, whether physical, whether etheric, whether we were across the earth, somehow, in some way, we know that we have always been tied to the heart of Lanello. And so, level upon level, each one of these historical scenes of the community coming together for a purpose, it's like 
a dinner plate and there are these stacks of dinner plates one upon the other and when they get all piled up they form a mighty spiral and if we're up here on the spiral and we have to go back down here to remove or transmute something that's in a lower level in order to gain the ultimate victory then that is exactly what we must do so this is why we proceed to accept the word of Portia that history can be changed to heed the instruction of Kuan Yin that now that we have certain levels of attainment we can deal with situations and personages that we were not necessarily able to deal with in those eras many times it looks as though the conclusion of an era was a defeat or a loss but in the totality of the spiral we see it moving toward victory because of the experience and the God mastery that is gained this is the most wonderful thing about the teaching of the doctrine of reincarnation that we get a wider and longer spiral as an assessment of where we have been and where we are going and we understand so much more about ourselves we understand our burden of light as well as our burden of darkness many times the world condemnation that we feel today had its roots peculiar roots in these various scenes and because the people who participated in those scenes have retained the condemnation and history has recorded the condemnation the entire collective community of chilas of Lanello also bear that and so I find that the directing of our invocations into these very specific crystals of condemnation or crystals of imperil is exactly what it takes to be free from old records so I have personally found a great release in delivering these lectures and I think that the one I'm going to give to you today is also going to be a source of great release not only to me but to all of us so for those of you who have not heard the earlier lectures I would like to give you a summary of Mark's incarnations and some of the ones that we went over the earliest memory we have of Mark that has been revealed is on Atlantis when he was a priest of the sacred fire and a master of invocation in the temple of the Logos I will tell you how I found this out as I would walk along with Mark and follow him and be with him in the early days of my Chila ship before my duties became so involved that I was not with him so much we would encounter this or that condition and he would make an invocation or he would lead our morning invocations and I would listen to him and hear his invocations and be so impressed that I had never heard such a voice such a power such a contact with God and such an ability to invoke God so I asked him one day uh, how did you figure out how to do that <laughs> <laughs> and he said oh he said I was a master of invocation on Atlantis I said oh <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we got that embodiment <laughs> I never have ceased to be impressed with our beloved Lanello and the power of his voice to quiver the cosmos itself well he lived as Lot Abram's brother's son in the 20th century BC 4,000 years ago he was the man of God in the wretched cities of the plain Sodom and Gomorrah and that history is briefly recorded in early scripture 3300 years ago he was the Egyptian Pharaoh Ikhnaten he overthrew the tradition of idolatry of the Nephilim gods who encamped in the Middle East long before the coming of Ikhnaten he challenged the false priesthood and established monotheism the worship of the mighty I am presence which was to him Aton symbolized in the disk of the Sun during his reign Egypt enjoyed a golden age of art and poetry and music it is said that the children of Israel who were in Egypt 400 years and Moses himself learned what he knew about monotheism 
from the teachings and the doctrine of Akhenaten, and that Moses was a follower of Akhenaten, and that the reason that the children of Israel were actually enslaved in Egypt was because they would not worship the black priests who, once they had murdered Akhenaten and his family, returned Egypt to the practice of black magic of Amun. And the god Amun, the name Amun, has its roots in Nephilim lore. You will find that name uh, among those that are listed in the pantheon of Nephilim gods. So this group of Hebrews who were in Egypt were monotheists under Moses, and they stuck to their religion, the religion of Sanat Kumara and Yahweh, and Moses, having been brought up as a baby in Pharaoh's court, had access to all of Egyptian mysticism and centered himself on the teachings of Akhenaten. So this is a tremendous link when we realize that we were there with Akhenaten and we were there again with Moses and following the thread of the determination to be a community and to surround ourselves with light and to surround the mighty I Am Presence with that unswerving devotion. There were infiltrators in the community of the Hebrews who were finally delivered of their captivity. And on the desert itself, in the long trek to the Promised Land, there were many acts of judgment pronounced upon the serpent and his seed, uh, the betrayers, the those who were disobedient, those who challenged the authority of Moses. And those very harsh judgments that descended are amazing to contemplate uh, when you read about it without the enlightenment and the understanding of truly the Nephilim creation. That was 1375 to 1358. We gave you and will be publishing our work on Aesop in this embodiment, he comes in the guise of a Greek slave in the 6th century BC who won his freedom as a master of didactic stories and fables. And so he stripped people of their own disguises and exposed them by himself, taking on a countenance and a body that was considered asymmetrical and even ugly and becoming the wisest uh, always among those who considered themselves masters. He was murdered by the townspeople that he sought to serve. So he was a martyr between 620 and 560. We have Linello's own account dictated as an ascended master of the embodiment as the Arabian shepherd boy in the Syrian foothills of the Middle East. And the shepherd incarnation, truly being a shepherd of sheep, which the Maha Chohan enjoyed in India, which St. Patrick had six years of when he was enslaved in the British Isles before he went on his mission. This role, of course, is the archetype of learning to become the shepherd of souls. He was Mark the Evangelist who wrote the account of the works of Jesus, the Gospel of Deeds, as confided to him by Peter the Apostle. His mother was one of the most devoted of the women disciples, and Mark remembered when as a boy Jesus celebrated the Last Supper in the upper room. He was reared as an Essene, and being well educated was chosen Peter's chief disciple and secretary, and was taken to Antioch to assist Paul. He became an exponent of the deeper mysteries of Christianity and founded the church at Alexandria, Egypt, where he was later martyred. So he returns to Egypt once again. It's a very interesting thing about the Egyptian connection continually going back to Egypt. The son of Jacob took for his wife the daughter of an Egyptian priest. And so it was the fusion of the heart flames of the Hebrew, Joseph, who was the embodiment of Jesus Christ, and Asenath, who was the daughter of the Egyptian priest. This fusion of these two life waves produced the offspring of Ephraim and Manasseh, who are the sons of Joseph, who reincarnated and peopled not only the British Isles, but the United States, and became the English-speaking peoples of the world. 
And so when you think about this bloodline coming down as Jesus Christ, the progenitor of the seed of Sanat Kumara, and you realize that it crossed again through Egypt, it goes back, of course, to the flame of Serapis Bay, and therefore our own community's incarnation there. So there goes Mark to found the Church of Alexandria. His gospel was written in 68 AD. He was martyred in the city, and Origen himself, which was the next incarnation, 185 to 254 AD, Origen is, of course, Origen of Alexandria, Egypt. He goes right back to where he left off as Mark, is not in the least bit perturbed about having been martyred there, is ready to be martyred again, and has the sense of the ongoing flame of mission. And so it is the ongoing flame of community. Origen had many supporters. He became known there as one of the most distinguished theologians of the early church, setting forth the true teachings of Jesus Christ on reincarnation and the heavenly hierarchy. At the age of 18, he was appointed head of the catechetical school, the first institution where Christians could be instructed in both the Greek sciences and the doctrines of Holy Scripture. This shows that he was not narrow-minded. He lived as an ascetic, working day and night with the crowds, lecturing and giving personal consultation. He made a thorough study of Plato, Pythagoras, and the Stoics, and learned Hebrew in order to properly interpret scripture. This broader awareness makes us think about the Apostle Paul and his broadened understanding of these philosophies. But his deep understanding seemed to shallow worldly minds, fantastic and heretical banished from Egypt, Origen nevertheless became an honored teacher in Palestine at Caesarea where he established a school famous throughout the East. He was banished by members of his own church who were jealous of his profound wisdom. He was imprisoned during the persecution of Decius, tortured and later died. He left behind a massive body of writings numbering close to 1,000 titles. His books were widely used for more than a century, but not without harsh criticism. In the fifth century, Rufinus of Achelia translated and made significant alterations in Origen's work, and Jerome condemned his teaching as heresy. In the sixth century, a list of 15 anathemata were drawn up in the fifth ecumenical council, followed by the physical destruction of his writings, of which few remain today. Do you think that God would allow the entire effort of Origen to perish with the burning of his books? God is always more clever than this. In the writing of these books, there were students, and the teachings were hid in their hearts. Everything that Origen taught is a part, again, of the community of the Holy Spirit. The devotees and the saints that surrounded him, that read and studied, that sat in his classes, that learned from him, and have continued to learn from him in etheric temples, contain those mysteries. Basically, the entire teaching of the Ascended Masters was contained in Origen's writings. You may understand now specifically why, when you first came upon the teachings, you already knew them. It is not because of some miraculous presence. It is because in previous incarnations you've experienced the law and the teaching and you've been under the gurus who have never compromised the light of truth, both in East and West. This list of embodiments leaves vacant vast centuries in the last 4,000 years where there is no accounting or list of where he was and yet we know he was almost continually incarnating because of the advanced nature of his soul and the ongoing nature of the evolution of community. And so we have the civilizations of the Indus Valley, of the Hindus, of the Buddhists, of China, of the East, and other places in the West and South America that have not even uncovered what Lanello and his community of light bearers were doing during these centuries. So as we pass through these and give the calls of transmutation, I'm sure that the next ones will be uncovered. Once they are uncovered, they are a burden until they are transmuted. This is why the Brotherhood leaves past incarnations sealed. 
As Clovis, he established the French monarchy in the sixth century. He married his twin flame, the Burgundian princess Clotilde, a Christian, and was baptized after successfully challenging her god to give him victory in battle. He became a devoted representative of the church, and Clovis and Clotilde became patron saints of France as the founders of the nation and patron and patroness of the poor. You know him as Lancelot du Lac. In the days of Arthur the King, he came from France once again, picking up on the previous incarnation of Clovis. According to legend, the infant Lancelot was laid down beside a lake, and the lady of the lake carried him off to her kingdom of 10,000 maidens where no man was allowed. Here he matured in great honor and purity, and thus was known as Lancelot du Lac. Lancelot of the Lake. He became Arthur's closest friend, their sole relationship that of Guru and Chila, and the champion of Queen Guinevere, his twin flame. The jealousy, intrigue, and witchcraft of Modred and Morgana le Fay challenged the deep mutual love of the trinity of Camelot, driving wedges of distrust between king and queen, knight champion, and the other knights of the round table ending in the death of Arthur and most of the knights and the seclusion of Guinevere and Launcelot in respective roles as renunciates of the church. This is between 5 and 600 AD. We think of this incarnation together at Camelot as being a very important point in our history and the point from which we take off again because of the great goals that were there of the fact that we certainly did leave off from finishing the victory spiral for Britain and for the nations who are the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh, for all of the 12 tribes, for the grail that was buried at Glastonbury. And so we do see our mission as fulfilling that and transmuting it. It's a very interesting situation that in each of these embodiments, there is someone who undoes the hero. There is the black magician, there is the serpent, there is the fallen one who comes into the peace, plays his role on stage, and somehow has a superior use of black magic to undo the finest hopes and dreams of those gathered together. Always because there is some weakness in the light bearers. We must have an open door for mistrust, we must have an open door for condemnation, or whatever it is that unseats us and allows us to momentarily lose contact with the guru, just as Peter did when he sank beneath the waves. And so we can see that the encounter with these individuals, the ones that burned the works of, of origin, the ones that martyred him, martyred Aesop, uh, there were many enemies with Clovis and Clotilde, and the compromise of the teachings of Jesus Christ that occurred uh, after the setting forth of the Gospels. Each one of these situations, take Pharaoh Ignaton, is plagued with the Nephilim black magicians who are determined to destroy the community of the Holy Spirit. If you can enter the record of the slaying of Ignaton and Nefertiti, it is one of the worst massacres that you can even imagine, the terror of it. I have met any numbers of people who have come to me and said they had a flashback on it, and they have described it exactly as I have also seen it. And those kinds of records do leave indelible memories. And what all of this teaches us is that until we have the same attainment in light that the black magicians have in their darkness, we will not vanquish the same foes that reincarnate also and come again and again, and they become the testing of our metal. So we see it today, we see it as an ongoing situation, and remembering these people, remembering these situations, I have often identified both friend and foe alike, coming through the halls of Camelot here, coming through the organization, some stay, some leave, and uh, so there is a sifting of hearts, and there is a final opportunity to be on the side of light. I think I have mentioned at Summit University that uh, when I was doing personal clearances, I was in Santa Barbara, and I stood there, and I was making an invocation and a blessing upon the head 
of someone who had, in a previous life, affected my demise by the guillotine. And it was flashed to me at the moment that I had my hands on his head for making the invocations. <laughs> I was so grateful to think that it had come full circle and that this soul could be received as a chila, had gone through Summit University, obviously was a hireling, it was a job he was doing, and uh, obviously desired to be on the path of light. Also had certain psychological problems from the sense of guilt about the situation and extreme condemnation. So here was a great opportunity, and I noticed how great was the Holy Spirit and the love of God, and what intense love I felt for this person, and how great is the love that restores both sides of the, of the whole to wholeness, and that in these encounters there is such a release of the sacred fire that each one is free. Each one is free to be independent of that karmic record. Each one can go on and fulfill his divine plan. And so that often occurs. So there are many reasons why people come to Camelot. This particular soul is still with us in a very devoted chila. And I've never revealed to him this incarnation because I would not, of course, wish to add to his burden. Well, we have Saladin, the great Muslim leader. We went over that embodiment of the 12th century. He conquered and united all of the Mohammedan world. And although a powerful general, Saladin is remembered for his generosity, gentleness, honesty, and justice to both Arabs and Christians alike. He was Saint Bonaventure, and we have given that embodiment. The seraphic doctor of the church, prince of the mystics, he was the child healed by Saint Francis of Assisi, who declared, O Buona Ventura, O good fortune. And thus the boy received his name. Together with Thomas Aquinas, a Dominican, Bonaventure, a Franciscan, played an important role in defending the mendicant orders in the 13th century. So he went on to defend the life's work of Francis and Claire, and there is that ongoing marvelous chain of light of the eighth and ruby ray. We come to his embodiment then of Louis XIV, King of France, which was from 1643 to 1715, the longest recorded reign in European history. He was known as Le Roi Soleil, the Sun King, harking back to the golden age of Ignaton. He sought to outpicture his sole memory of the culture of Venus in the magnificent palace and gardens of Versailles in the culture and God government that he externalized. It is this point in the evolution of our community that we come to rest today. It is the consideration of this community and our entire experience together with Louis XIV at Versailles. So I will take up this incarnation how many of you remember the music that was played when I came in? It is a fanfare of Versailles, played in his court by his musicians. If you were there, you've heard it before. <laughs> Did it sound familiar? Well, I have one more melody to play you from that era, and then I'll begin the story. <laughs> was a minuet performed at Versailles. Remember when we used to do the minuet in grammar school? 
where I grew up, they taught us the minuet. Well, we haven't added that to our repertoire of dance, but perhaps we will. A lot has been said and can be said about Louis XIV. It is our job to penetrate the volumes upon volumes of history and of gossip surrounding this experience, to study the facts of his life and to try to understand the soul and why he acted as he did and what was he working out for us and with whom and what forces, cross currents of history, did he have to deal in order for us to move onward. Only a few decades after sunspots were discovered, they disappeared altogether for 70 years, with very rare and isolated exceptions. The period lasted from 1645 to 1715, or the equivalent of what we now reckon to be more than six normal solar cycles. It coincided almost to the day with the reign of Louis XIV, the Sun King. The birth of Louis XIV on September 5, 1638, at Saint-Germain, near Paris, was heralded by the people of France as a miracle. Very interesting quarter of Paris called Saint-Germain, Saint-Germain. The king and queen of France, Louis XIII and Anne of Austria, had been estranged for almost 20 years when one night a sudden cloudburst caused the king to seek shelter at his wife's apartment. The subsequent birth of a son, combining the two great dynasties of Bourbon and Habsburg, seemed to be the answer to the prayers of France for a male heir who would assure the succession to the throne. Hence he was called Louis le Dieu donné, Louis the God-given, or the gift of God. Now remember, this is his second incarnation upon the throne of France. His first, he is the original king, who happened to be one among many powerful rulers of separate and independent states in what is now France. And he became the one superior to all who united, united all of France under one dominion, and did so at the inspiration of his wife to pray to her Christian God. So first he founds the nation, then he returns to bring France to her greatest glory. The king and queen had consecrated his birth to the Virgin Mary, and truly he came into the world to the chorus of hundreds of 40-hour devotions and thousands of votive masses rising from the churches of France. Throughout his reign, Louis XIV would continue this tradition of ordering religious services to thank God and the Blessed Virgin for benefits bestowed upon the kingdom. No doubt you can look back in tenderness and recall your own keeping the flame for the birth of the king or giving prayers throughout his reign. I would like to point to the fact that he came in under the sign of Virgo, it is an earth sign, and people who have the mastery of the sign become experts, or are experts, in the mastery of detail. This was one of the great attributes of Louis XIV. The earth signs, Capricorn, Taurus, and Virgo, are also the signs of the temple builders. When his father died in 1643, Four-year-old Louis became king, with his mother acting as regent and Cardinal Mazarin, his godfather, assuming the role of first minister, the real power behind the throne. Mazarin, as it is pronounced in English, both became important influences in the life of young Louis. His mother, who was determined that her son would be not only a king, but a great king, cultivated in him the sense of personal majesty and innate courtesy, which some consider to be his saving grace. The cardinal took on the responsibility of supervising the young king's education. You can see in the heart of this mother a certain reflection of Mother Mary to give him the sense 
of the office of the king as a bearer of grace and of the majesty of the Savior himself. The courtesy becomes the grace of God, and one can feel in Louis's life his own sense of holiness, not about his person, but about the office that he occupies. And he becomes so one with the office entrusted to him as representing God on earth as king, that it is both himself and the office who are one. He said, l'état c'est moi. He and the state are one. He saw, he saw no difference between himself and the office that God had given to him. This is one of the most important lessons as well ex as examples that we can derive from the way he lived his life. We hold an office, and the most important office we hold is Chila of the Ascended Masters. We ought also to strive for majesty in our bearing, self-respect, ennoblement, and the virtues that extol and show our appreciation for the mantle that is upon us. And this is not personal pride, or should not be, but it should be the extolling of the light within. And so an array of carefully selected tutors were appointed to begin teaching Louis subjects considered appropriate for a future ruler. Remember, he is age four. It is generally considered that these were insufficient, with more emphasis on writing and fencing than on history and grammar. But he did receive a good practical education based on the concept that a king is almost entirely concerned with action. I would say that this emphasis on action was actually the seeds of the Montessori method, the development of mind, heart, and soul, body, and rhythm, the functions of the brain, and so forth. We know that it requires action, and we know that it requires that figure eight flow with the Holy Spirit. So probably, the expertise that he acquired in these areas made him also mentally adept. He became a skilled horseman, swordsman, and swimmer, and approached music and dancing with the same avidity. Playing several musical instruments and dancing his first solo ballet at age 13. Later, he would be the first king to have musicians directed by a conductor in the modern manner. Dubois gave us a glimpse of the king's day when Louis was in his teens. As soon as he awakes, he recites the office of the Holy Spirit and his rosary. That being done, his preceptor enters for a study period, reading from Holy Scripture or the history of France. After that, he gets out of bed, and we four members of the household enter. He then sits on the cutout chair in the alcove of the chamber. He then enters the grand chamber, where usually there are princes and great lords who attend his levee. He is clothed in a dressing gown and goes before them, speaking familiarly, first to one, then to another, which enchants them. After he has eaten his first breakfast, he washes his hands, mouth, and face, takes off the cap that had been tied about his head because of his hair. He then prays to God in the passageway behind his bed, accompanied by his chaplains while everyone is on their knees. And if anyone dares to talk or make any noise, a housier removes him. The prayer of the king finished, he brushes his hair, puts on his suit, stockings of serge, and goes out to the large chamber behind his antechamber, where he does his exercises. He jumps to and fro with remarkable agility. Then he rides his horse at full caper and drills with a pike. After this, he returns to the chamber, where he dances under the direction of Maitre Beauchamp, and he next goes back to his grand chamber where he changes clothes. Leaving the chamber each morning, he makes the sign of the cross and then goes up to the cardinal's rooms, where a secretary of state makes his reports on the most secret affairs of the king, requiring a half hour to an hour and a half. After that, the king goes to greet the queen, his mother, probably between 11 and 12, for Anne was a late riser, and then goes to hear mass. After mass, he returns to his rooms, changes clothes, either to go on a hunt or to remain in the palace. If it is to be a hunt, he wears an ordinary hunting costume. If he stays, it is a modest one. His body is so well built that one cannot say more about it. 
After dressing, he goes to dine, often with a queen. Sometimes after dinner, there is an audience with ambassadors to whom he listens attentively. In truth, he has a charm that makes it an honor to be near him and that merits that a queen of Sheba should come to see and hear what God has seen fit to put in this vessel of election. So that was an eyewitness of the king's day. Mazarin himself proved to be the most influential of Louis' teachers, for he taught by living personal example the art of governing a nation. He took him to council meetings to gain insight into the political problems of the day and sent him to the battlefront to learn the strategies of war. When Hardouin, Louis' preceptor, expressed concern over the young king's disinclination to formal studies and that it might later cause him to neglect affairs, Mazarin perceptively replied, do not let this trouble you. Depend on it. He will always know enough about them. For whenever he comes to the council, he asks me innumerable questions about the matter in hand. All that we've even read to begin with shows the amazing detail and order of his consciousness. Although Hardouin himself was to leave an indelible impression on the young king, teaching him the royal virtues of justice, benevolence, and mercy, other instructors with other motives taught Louis that it is the right of a king to make his will the law of his kingdom. Hardouin would have Louis translate such passages as, My subjects are so many children whom God has entrusted to my care. It is the duty of a father to increase the happiness of his children, to guard their possessions, and to watch over their safety. At the same time, Louis's writing master would have him write repeatedly, Homage is due to kings. They may do as they please. According to reports of his contemporaries, Louis was a grave, sedate, even somewhat austere prince, yet gracious, obliging, dignified, exquisitely polite, and blessed with a perfect ease of manner. His gentleness was often a topic of court conversation and caused his confessor to write, in all the world there is no more gentle or more pliant lamb than our king. He bestowed affection on his servants and even threw his pocket money to the stable boys. He seldom laughed and yet possessed a charming politeness of manner and was extraordinarily robust and handsome. At age 10, his education was interrupted by the fronde, meaning sling, an anti-Mazarin rebellion which broke out in Paris in 1648, continuing four years and leaving an unforgettable impression on the young king. It was a frightening and confusing experience for him, since his family continued to assure him of the sanctity of his kingship while at the same time fleeing from his subjects. In 1652, Louis and Mazarin entered Paris as victors, but the four years of treason and turmoil had left their scars, causing Louis to distrust those responsible and to later move the royal residence from Paris to Versailles, refusing to allow the Paris parliamentarians to in any way interfere with his royal decrees. The royal coronation, which had been delayed because of the fronde, took place on June 7, 1654 in Reims, cathedral that is very well known and figures very important as a focus in France, a focus of the Brotherhood. He was consecrated with a holy oil that had come, quote, directly from heaven for the consecration of Clovis. It's very interesting. Evidently, a miracle occurred at the coronation of Clovis and they had actually kept the oil and anointed Louis with the same oil. Domestic discord over, Louis found his first and perhaps only true love, according to historians. Marie Mancini, the fifth niece of Mazarin, but he was soon to learn that duty comes before desire when a king must choose a bride. Mazarin and the Queen Mother appealed to Louis's good sense, imploring him to understand that the sovereign of the mightiest nation in Europe would have to take a royal bride that would be useful to the realm. In his situation, that would mean a Spanish alliance, and the decision had already been made to marry him to a daughter of King Philip IV of Spain. 
Not without struggle, he finally surrendered to the goals that Mazarin and his mother held before him, to renounce personal satisfactions, personal happiness, personal desires, to achieve his gloire, to make himself worthy before God and the world for the title of the most glorious king, and to satisfy the needs of his state. This concept of la gloire, or the glory, is really the concept of the Shekinah glory, the light descending from the mighty I Am Presence, and the necessity of those who hold a holy office under God to forego the personal self for the greater glory of the light itself to be able to shine through the transparency of oneself on behalf of all those who are beneath one on the scale of hierarchy. So the path of self-sacrifice was actually taught and it descends, as we shall see, all the way from the archetype of kings, the kings of Israel. And for Louis, these were actually his models in reigning. He modeled himself after those kings. On June 9, 1660, in a royal ceremony at Saint-Jean, Saint-Jean-de-Luz, King Louis Fourteenth of France married Marie Therese of Spain. At the time, an observer described Louis as being tall and robust, with a countenance that is at once proud and sweet. Even should he disguise himself, one would recognize immediately that he is the master, for he has the air by which we recognize those whom we speak of as having the blood of the gods. This quote, whoever wrote it, comes from the consciousness and the realization that the essence of Christ is in the blood and that those who do have the Christ light and the Christ seed have, as he describes it, the blood of the gods, but they have a special quality that is recognizable even as the serpents of the earth have a special earmark that is recognizable. His eyes are brilliant and piercing. In him one recognizes that magnanimity includes elevation of grandeur and moderation of power. Here's this word magnanimity, magnanimous, that has been used again and again to describe Lanello in his various incarnations by his biographers. His bride, in contrast, was tiny, fair-haired, and blue-eyed, idolized as a child and filled with virtue she was simple-minded and humble in nature, with, it was said, the qualities and virtues of a nun in the heart of a queen, but lacking in the sharp wit and intelligence that Louis had so adored in Marie. On the morning of March 9, 1661, Louis was awakened with the news of Cardinal Mazarin's death. Addressing Louis, he had earlier written, God has given you all the qualities for greatness. I will die happy when I see you prepared to govern by yourself, using your ministers only to present you with advice, profiting from it in the manner that pleases you, and giving them the orders on which they are to act. If you begin to take pleasure in this affairs of state, I say to you without flattery or exaggeration that you will make more progress and that you will profit more in a month than another will in six. Sincerely grieved for the loss of this friend and guide, but relieved to at last be his own master, Louis ordered a special meeting of the council. It was expected that he would appoint a new first minister to replace Mazarin, but to their amazement he announced, the time has come for me to govern by myself. You will assist me with your advice when I ask for it. He ruled the government personally for the remaining 55 years of his reign, startling his contemporaries and historians who consider the change a revolution in the history of France. You who know Mark personally from having known him or from his tapes, from his voice, from his teachings, from his vibration, have already recognized in what has been said here certain qualities and attributes of Lanello that are very typical. His personal involvement in this government 
was exactly the way he ran the Summit Lighthouse. He was very much involved in every single thing that was happening in every part of the organization. Louis believed that he was the viceroy of God, as Cardinal Mazarin and his mother had taught him from his earliest infancy. Thus he believed in the divine right of kings. Originally, in the early golden ages, the sons of God were appointed in positions of hierarchy to be rulers of the people. And this came down to us, and we see it in the Old Testament and in Scripture. The royal houses of Europe, and in fact of the entire world, are a long story of sons of light being on the throne, being displaced by Nephilim gods and fallen ones who wreak havoc in the kingdom, who undermine uh, the nations, the economy, misuse their position, become more interested in ambition and power and war than the good of the people. The people rise up and they overthrow the entire principle of royalty and of the monarchy because of what the Nephilim do when they arrive in positions of power. But the original matrix and the true matrix of the king is that he is the one who holds the key to the incarnation of God in all the people because he represents the Christ to the people. K-I-N-G, key to the incarnation of God. So to be king, uh, which there are a few today, means to have that, that hierarchical office of divine direction given to one as a mantle, as a grace, and therefore possessing the authority of Almighty God. So this was the belief, the supreme belief of Louis, and he attempted to carry it out to his fullest understanding. His instructors had woven into his lessons the idea that kings were divinely ordained to rule over the less enlightened and had presented the Jewish kings of the Old Testament as models for him to imitate. It was a concept widely believed at the time, but Louis also understood that kings were divinely appointed not for their own good, but for the good of the governed. Thus he saw it as his public duty to become master of the realm, more for his subjects' sake than for his own. Never distinguishing between his own destiny and that of the state, he declared, l'état c'est moi, I am the state. So should you say, I am the community, I am the church. Wherever I am, I am the embodiment of the community of the Holy Spirit, I am the incarnation of the church universal and triumphant. He was demonstrating the internalization of the word. He wrote, it seems to me that we must be at the same time humble on our own account and proud on account of the office we fill. This is that fundamental teaching of El Moria to us. We are humble before God, but we are defenders of the office we hold because the office is the mantle of God. And therefore, to allow the mantle to be trampled upon is unthinkable. To allow the level of hierarchy that we occupy to be violated is unthinkable. He gave his advice to his son, the Dauphin, and he wrote an entire book, a volume of advice to that king on how he should carry out his reign. And these are some of his writings. Although it is proper for us to take pride in the dignity of our office, a certain modesty and humility is no less becoming. Do not think, my son, that such virtues are not for us. On the contrary, they are more appropriate in us than in the rest of mankind. If one has not achieved a position of preeminence, either by birth or by natural ability, then no matter how little he may think of himself, he can never be humble or modest. These virtues presuppose on the part of him who practices them an importance sufficient to justify a certain vanity. But when those about you wish only to fill you with a sense of your own importance, do not, my son, compare yourself with lesser princes. Think rather of those in past centuries who are most to be envied and admired. Reflect upon your own shortcomings. In so doing, you will learn to be humble. But when you act as a king and not as an individual, when it is a question of your rights and of the privileges of your crown, boldly assume the loftiness of mind and of spirit of which you will find yourself capable. Do not betray your glorious predecessors 
or jeopardize the interests of those who are to follow you, for you hold your office in trust. In such a case, humility is despicable. So the two sides of the coin of the understanding of oneself as a chila, even when one occupies a high office, and the realization of humility before the great guru, the realization of humility before one's own faults, and the necessity of remembering those faults when the world praises you. He makes a very interesting point that those who have nothing about which to be, be vain cannot really be humble because they are already humbled by their karma, and therefore in them hum humility is no virtue. But humility is virtue in one who has something to be proud about but instead is more humble. Breaking the pattern of his predecessors who had left the governing of the nation in the hands of the first minister, Louis spent long hours working at the problems of state, immensely enjoying the, quote, trade of being king. He defined the most important aspects of this trade to be the choice of suitable servants to operate the government. This is the choosing of chilas who would best embody his ideals that he was drawing forth from his inner God presence the consideration of projects, plans, and policies, the externalization of the blueprint of the mandala of our community, and the making of rational decisions for action. Action, the outplaying of Yahweh through the Holy Spirit in the course of historical events. Louis XIV, no doubt, made mistakes in his decisions for action, and there is no question that he would be and was the first to admit those mistakes as he realized them toward the, ends of his, the end of his life. He wrote, Even from childhood, the very name of do-nothing kings and mayors of the palace distressed me when it was uttered in my presence. Of course, the do-nothing functionaries that seem to get in the way in court life are always a focus of the anti-guru and the anti-chila. They do nothing, but they occupy space and they managed to get underfoot and spoil one's best projects. It was his desire to see everything, know everything, and to decide every issue. At court, this evolved into a spy system in which he had the correspondence of his courtiers opened, examined, resealed, and delivered, sometimes resulting in a sudden dismissal. He considered it his duty to have a thorough and minute knowledge of his kingdom and an understanding of military and political history in order to learn from the notable events of the past. To him, the state was a practical and scientific organization, but it could not be without the ingredient of justice. In this regard, he wrote, the function of kings consists principally in permitting good sense to do its work, for it always acts naturally and without difficulty. In choosing men for high positions in state, Louis bypassed those of high nobility and rank, preferring instead those with professional status because he believed it necessary for people to know by the rank of the men who served him that he had no intention of sharing authority with them. He continued the nobility's exemption from taxes but forced its members into financial dependence on the crown, thus creating a court nobility with much idle time who devoted most of their energy to ceremonial etiquette and petty intrigues. Now this is a very interesting thing, this court of nobility. It is obviously a not good matrix. It is obviously a negative part of his reign. The idle nobility living off of the energies and the light and the authority of the king, but obviously that authority which is ultimately derived from God in the hearts of the people. And therefore, this entire court of nobility is living off the taxation of the people of France and yet really contributing nothing for it. Well, what should they have been? What was the point of all these people surrounding Louis XIV? We cannot imagine a king and queen alone in the gigantic palace of Versailles. Obviously, they had to be surrounded by certain people, but why is this so? Well, when you understand 
the nature of the guru-chila relationship and you can understand his position as the position of guru in our community, you can see that this court nobility was the precursor of circles of devotees reinforcing the light of Alpha. Their role was, or should have been, that of Omega. They should have been coordinates who receive and carry out the directives of the hierarch. They should have been those who were the mystical body of God, the real nobility, noble because they were the seed of Christ and of Sanat Kumara. They should have been advanced chilas on the path who lived a life of self-sacrifice on behalf of those who are the sheep of the entire country, the general population. So if you think that yeah, of the, the concept of the guru occupying the position of I am presence, which is father or alpha, then the nobility should be occupying the position of the Christed ones, being concerned for the good of the people, and as a go-between between the people and the guru. So in this situation, as it would have been today, today it would be the body of souls surrounding the point of alpha who lower into manifestation as they occupy the role of Omega, all of the light of the Great White Brotherhood, the dictations, the teachings, the dynamic decrees, the purposes, the plans, the projects, and so forth. So there, there is an Alpha, which is the central light of, of community, which is our I Am Presence. And our mighty I Am Presence is personified in the one who is leader or the one who is messenger. Surrounding and necessary to support the spiritual quivering principle of the life force becomes the whole body of souls who comprise the Omega manifestation. It's like our position in the sanctuary now. By the fact of polarity, I stand in the Alpha position, you in the Omega. If you did not create this force field with the dynamic decrees, I could not bring forth the teaching because there would be no fallow field of consciousness in the matter universe to receive it. We read in the book of Enoch, that the mother of the world came down to live upon earth and she couldn't stay. She had to go back into heaven because there was no one to receive her. That's in the history of the cycles of Sanat Kumara. So Louis could not depend upon his court or the nobility that he supported to, to uh, be the instruments of the light. And therefore, a very critical factor in his reign was that he was not surrounded with a circle of light bearers to protect him from enormous treachery and intrigue and ultimately Satanism that was practiced directly against him and his wife. And so the plot thickens and we realize that though God has sent one whom he sponsors, there is not a rallying of forces in the way we have rallied today to support the mission of the entire Great White Brotherhood, which Arlanello represents. So Louis removed the political power of the provincial nobles he curtailed local authorities, and he built his centralized bureaucracy on the bourgeoisie. Now, Louis did understand in his soul, as we have said, not only the divine right of kings, but the overshadowing presence of the guru, Sanat Kumara, his sponsor beyond the veil. In Israel, this form of government constituted what is called a theocracy. Theocracy, the word theo meaning God, is a government of a state by immediate divine guidance. Thus, David, Saul, Solomon, and the good kings of Israel responded to God either through the intercession of Samuel or other prophets or their own heart flame. Here is the understanding then of theocracy and of monarchy side by side. But Louis himself was not theocratic in the fullest sense of the word. He did not really outpicture in this life the ultimate integration with the guru as a theocracy. He did not even pretend to be over the Church of France or over religious affairs, but in a sense he was God incarnate because of the very virtue he embodied. What we do discover when we contemplate this fusion of God government in spirit which is theocracy, and in matter, which is the monarchy, we look at all of the lives of Mark Prophet, and we come to the understanding that the fusion of all of his embodiments, whether the, it's the, the priest of invocation on Atlantis, or Lot, or Ignaton, 
or Mark, or Origen, or Clovis, or Lancelot, or Saladin, or Bonaventure, Louis the Fourteenth, all the way down to Mark Prophet. There is in Mark Prophet the embodiment of all these experiences, so that what we experience in him is this synthesis of the one who represents to us most clearly the God government of our community according to the principles of spirit and the principles of matter. So there is a culmination here as we study these lives, and we realize how important was this lifetime of this length of reign, how fastidious he was to the physical details of the state. I witnessed in Mark this God government as God control in spirit and matter fused in him and in his heart flame. And so I saw him as that vessel of the incarnate word, as messenger, teacher, and forerunner of the age of Aquarius. He embodies for us the ideal of the philosopher, priest, king. We see Aesop, the philosopher. We see the priest, Bonaventure, Origen, Mark. We see the many kings, east and west. And finally, in that final incarnation, they all come together. But this attainment could not be forged in one, in one life. And why is it? Because a single embodiment can simply not contain certain cycles of the infinite God that must come together. The priest is the father, the king is the son, the son king, and the philosopher is the Holy Spirit, the philosopher who becomes agent of healing through the understanding of wholeness. So here is the Trinity lived separately, and it finally comes together. Well, one thing I think that we all notice, I notice it in my life, that in a given embodiment where one is bringing together all of the steps and stages of one's causal body, it is scarcely possible to contain all of the knowledge and the momentums at the pinpoint of one's mind that one has gained in all these other embodiments. One would have to go to school for decades to become a master of those various areas that we have mastered separately in previous embodiments. So sometimes it becomes discouraging to think that we don't have all of these sharpened swords and talents available the moment we want them. But what really is true is that the Christ mind is a computer. It's a computerized mind. And without study, but by the Holy Spirit, there is a bypassing of the brain and there is a direct descent of the causal body and where this comes out is in the arena of action. When you have to do something, you know how to do it. When you have to speak, you know what to say. When you're building the community of the Holy Spirit, you just start doing and it flows like a dictation from your own causal body of a past attainment. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't get educated and study because all study and education furthers the discipline of the outer self to be able to be the instrument of the inner disciplines that are hid in the causal body. So I think that it's an exciting thing that when we take it all apart and put it all together again, that all these virtues come home, all these attainments, and we realize just how much God mastery our own mark had to have to begin the whole spiral which we are enjoying today. I'd like to give you another quote from his book on advice to his son. He writes, What makes for the greatness and the majesty of kings is not so much the scepter that they bear as the manner in which they bear it. This goes along with the principle that the person who holds an office shapes the office and bequeaths to the next office holder something more than he himself received. So offices in hierarchy are evolutionary in nature, and the free will of the individual Son of God actually has to do with the expansive and interesting designs that offices take on. The office of your chulaship under a chohan of the rays. It is a grant, it is a mantle, as you externalize the light, the faith, the momentums of the rays, you then create a larger mantle, which is passed on to the next devotee. And so an office always has a scepter, the scepter of your authority, 
is the authority of your own Christ self to act in the world of form as a representative of the world teachers. The way in which you bear this scepter is more important than the fact that you have it. You do have it. What you do with it is what counts. It is perverting the order of things to attribute decisions to the subjects and deference to the sovereign. And if I have described to you elsewhere the miserable condition of princes who commit their people and their dignity to the conduct of a prime minister, I have good cause to portray to you here the misery of those who are abandoned to the indiscretion of a popular assembly. For indeed, the prime minister is a man whom you choose as you see fit, whom you associate to your power only in so far as you please, and who has the greatest influence in your affairs only because he has the first place in your heart. And this is a very interesting principle because Louis is seeing the levels of the chart. The populace are the lower figure in the chart, those with least attainment in the exercise of free will. The prime minister would be the Christ self occupying the first position in the heart of the king. The king occupies the position of alpha. What he despises and what he tells his son not to do is to turn over to the people the decisions which the king should make or to turn over to the prime minister his office but always reminding the prime minister that he has his office and his authority by your own authority, by your right. Now let's say your position in hierarchy puts you in charge of a group of people when you're working at the inner retreat or you're a department head or wherever you work on the job in the world today, you are responsible for people, for money, for business, for whatever is happening. In your circle, you may occupy the point of alpha. You are representing the I am presence. You have people working for you whom you can trust, trust enough to make decisions, but not quite enough to turn over the whole business to them. They are in the sense of prime minister. They act in your stead and for you because you give them the power or the salary to do so. Then there would be the general people who uh, do more menial tasks. And what he is telling his son is do not mix up these roles or these offices. Do not come down from your position and give to others what they are not capable of outpicturing. You cannot expect the general populace to outpicture the fullness of the mighty I am presence. Sometimes businesses and organizations fail because those who are given the role of leadership abdicate and would rather have someone else do the job for them. And when they fail, they are astounded. And they say, well, I told so-and-so to do this, but he didn't do it. And try to blame on someone under them in a lower level of attainment what is, in fact, their own failure to assume the mantle and to exercise it. Whenever you have a mantle, whether it is of chila on the low rung of the scale or the fullness of the presence of the Christ self or the mantle of the I am presence, you cannot expect those that have not yet evolved to that position to be able to act in your stead with a full authority and attainment that you have. And at the same time, you recognize who is over you, such as the ascended masters or professional people that are more expert than you, and you realize that they will take the responsibility for certain areas of life and you know that they have the power to do it, that they will do it, that they are there, they are in charge. That's how I feel about El Moria and Lanello and St. Germain and so forth. But if I don't do my job, I cannot expect them to be successful at the job they are doing for me. I know they depend on me, and I depend on you, and you depend on others. So these levels of role playing, the correct assessment of one's office and the responsibility of that office begins to tell us what we can and cannot expect others to do. And so there are some things in this organization which I let no one do. Only I can do them. This is what I'm here for. This is the job I'm supposed to be doing. And so I have no desire to do some other job of grandeur, of, of going out and becoming famous and amassing a large movement and all kinds of followers and, and people filing in and wanting to see the guru and all those things. That doesn't interest me at all. What interests me is laying the foundation of the word for this age so that people will have it. 
long after you and I are in the higher octaves. So there are things I must do, there are things you can do, all kinds of wonderful things that you can take ultimate and total responsibility for within a department, within a business, within the ranch that we're going to be talking to you about momentarily. So Louis understood this. And this is one of the great things about his reign, his personal involvement, his realization that if you want a job done and you want it done right, you have to do it yourself. And that is what be, is behind every successful businessman. That's at the heart of the free enterprise system, and it's at the heart of representing the people in government. Now concerning this prime minister, in appropriating your possessions and your authority, he at least retains some gratitude and some respect for your person, this prime minister. Louis is realizing the fact that if you give power to someone, that someone may usurp that power. So how does he extend power and authority from his office at the same time maintaining control? This is the advice of the king to his son. And you think about it in running your own business. How do you delegate power and authority without giving the way, away the business and the business failing because of the accountant or the vice president or so-and-so mishandling that power? However great we make the prime minister, he cannot avoid his ruin if we have but the strength to will it. So you have to maintain your ability to give and to take away powers and authorities. At the most, you have only a single partner on the throne, this prime minister. If he despoils you of part of your glory, he unburdens you at the same time of your thorniest cares. This is the whole principle of delegation of office. When you share your office with someone, they also will share the glory. They will come in the limelight, and they will receive a portion of the glory of the office. But at the same time, you are unburdened of many duties which allow you to carry on other duties. The interest of his own greatness engages him to sustain yours. That's very interesting. Interesting concept of Louis, that the prime minister or the second in command under you is going to be for you because he knows he derives his position from you and from your own success. Now that's psychological motivation in people working together in a business situation. He wishes to preserve your rights as a possession that he enjoys in your name. And if he shares your diadem with you, he at least works to leave it intact to your descendants. But this is not the case with the power of a popular assembly. Now he's talking about someone at the level who does not have the attainment of the Christ self. The more you grant to a popular assembly, the more it demands. The more you caress it, the more it scorns you. And what it once has in its possession is retained by so many hands that it cannot be torn away without extreme violence. Out of so many persons who compose these great bodies, it, it, it is always the least sensible who assume the greatest license. Once you defer to them, they claim the right forever to control your plans according to their fancy. And the continual necessity of defending yourself against their assaults alone produces many more cares for you than all the other interests of your crown. So that a prince who wants to bequeath lasting tranquility to his people and his dignity completely intact to his successors cannot be too careful to suppress this tumultuous temerity. So much for the mind of the monarch concerning the popular assembly and representative government. Obviously, one is at odds with the other in the current evolution of our understanding of government. He sees himself as preserving the office bequeathed to him by God as the representative of the people. He realized that the, that the people do not understand that he is there as their servant and that they will desire to take his glory and his power unto themselves. Of course, this happened to his great-grandson, Louis XVI, and that was the end of the French monarchy for good. One of his first actions after assuming power was to arrest Nicolas Fouquet, the corrupt financial wizard who was the superintendent of finance and had been confidently anticipating the appointment of first minister. 
he was replaced by Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Colbert, the famous finance minister of Louis XIV. Now, I would like you to know that everyone I have named here just about has come to Camelot to stay or come and gone. It's a very, very interesting life. And I have watched events and people outplay these cycles, outplay the deep, dark levels of the subconscious that contain the hate and hate creation against the king or the queen, and I have seen the subconscious momentums of pure devotion spring forth and, and blossom on the path of chilaship. One thing we have to understand that in every embodiment, our motto is the motto of Jesus Christ, for judgment I am come. Judgment has a synonym, which is important for you to understand. It is resolution. If there is a being, an individual, anywhere upon earth, who has inside of his subconscious an intense hatred or a condemnation of you, your soul actually desires to meet and confront that individual as part of the path of your ascension so that you can give all the love of your heart and of God for the balance of any karma you have created with that person and so that their hatred can come out of them, can actually erupt and their aura turn inside out so that it is on the surface, so that all of this may come against you, so the judgment call may be given and they therefore must choose whether they will serve the light that is in you as the Christ or the light in God or they will serve the darkness that they have harbored against you. Now, hatred of light and light bearers remains in the subconscious of people permanently, thousands upon thousands of years. These identities are crisscrossing and we meet again. So a church such as this, an organization, is an opportunity for resolution. It's a marvelous resolution. We come full circle, we encounter the circumstance, we ride the wave above it, it goes into the violet flame, and two individuals are free. So this is why we understand there is the coming together again. There are many loyal followers, and there are those who will always be envious of the light because they do not have their own. They are envious of the power. They come seeking that power. It is not given to them, and therefore they become an angered and they start their little campaigns and their little circles of individuals who move against the light bearer. So it's simply part of the game and part of the path of the Guru Chila relationship. When you understand this, you rejoice because, as I say, the soul desires resolution. We don't want to be tied to these incomplete and imperfect situations. Louis did seek ministers whose knowledge of dealing with problems was greater than his own. But to assure that no one of these would dominate him, he would force them to debate their proposals in council whenever offering him advice. The rivalry between his most skilled and influential ministers, Louvois, his minister of war, and Colbert, minister of finance, became a central strand in the fabric of his reign. Whenever the two met in council to advise the king on war and peace, the rivalry between economist and soldier would flare. Louvois had the advantage because the king loved martial affairs, parades, reviews, and wars, while Colbert, with his prudent labor to build the national economy, could not bear to see his savings dissipated in the pursuit of glory. But Louis could not conceive of France except as glorious or of himself except as striving to keep her so. Mazarin had explained, It is up to you to become the most glorious king that has ever been. Louis wrote, The love of glory certainly takes precedence over all others in my soul. People reading that quote may interpret it in both extremes. They may see him as an egotist, as a maniac, as the, the beginning of the end of France, or they may understand the glory of which he spoke was his actual perception of the inner kingdom, which he had a burning desire to externalize. It was this passion for glory that was the motivating force behind the splendor of his court and his wars of conquest. Louis was determined to make the reign one of grandeur. Grandeur, what is it? 
We may understand it in the sense of the elevation of the Christ in the person. Others may think of it as the elevation of the ego. God is the judge of his life stream, and each one of you is free to draw your own conclusions. Louis was determined to make the reign one of grandeur, and that was an expensive proposition. the heart of God. Descend in the name of Saint Germain. Descend in the name of El Moria. Descend in the name of Sanat Kumara, the Blessed Virgin Mary. I call for a mighty clearing action on the incarnations of Lanello and Mother. I call for a mighty clearing action on the incarnations of the sons and daughters of God in this activity of light. By our oneness in the great God flame, let the very essence of all virtue be externalized for the victory of God upon earth in this hour. And let the mighty flame of the ruby ray, let the mighty action of the white fire, blue fire sun, let the mighty action of the violet flame penetrate through, blaze and transmute, blaze and transmute, the cause, effect, record, and memory of all that is not of the light, all that never should have been, by the great law of mercy's flame, by the great central sun magnet, I call for the mighty action of the sacred fire. I call to you, beloved Aramis and Diana. We ask you to walk through our four lower bodies, walk through our auras. Let there be a purging light. Let the magnificence of the seven mighty archangels appear. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Mother, Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Mother, Amen. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, of the Mother, Amen. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Won't you be seated? We're going to hear a bell right now, a huge bell. It was cast during the reign of Louis XIV, and it still hangs in Notre Dame Cathedral. It was blessed by the Archbishop Francois de Harlay on April 29th, 1685. And it was christened, this bell has a name, Emmanuel Louis Therese. In honor of its godparents, Louis XIV and his wife, Queen Marie Therese. It weighs more than eight tons, is eight feet and seven inches in diameter. It rings slightly below the low F sharp. When we published our volume of the music of the spheres, Harp Strings of Lemuria, I asked to have the bell of Notre Dame play for our Hail Mary. 
I remember hearing the bell of Notre Dame when I was 17 and I was in Paris and I went to visit the cathedral and it always had a very special sound for me so now I realize that at least one of the bells there is the focus of our twin flames. For those of you who did not hear the first part of this lecture, I recommend that you do. <laughs> because I'm not going to review, lest I give all of us more to contend with this evening. So I will continue exactly where I abruptly left off. At the point where Louis XIV was given the title Le Roi Soleil, the Sun King, in commemoration of the Sun God Apollo. Certainly fitting, realizing that Apollo and Lumina's retreat is over Lower Saxony, and Lanello's own retreat himself is at Bingen on the Rhine, where we were this summer, in a, a nearby area. The vibration of Lanello's retreat is so powerful and so intense, it fills the whole town and the whole valley surrounding Bingen. I was absolutely amazed to find myself so physically saturated in his aura by comparison to other parts of Europe where he does not seem to be so physical. Well, in honor of the birth of Louis XIV, a new coin had been designed with the inscript Orbis Solis Galici. Thus rises the sun of France. And it was pointed out by an astrologer that the sun itself had come closer to the earth than usual in order to associate itself with the new Dauphin. The symbol of the flaming sun became a recurrent theme throughout his reign. Even in his ballets in which Louis loved to dance the role of the sun, we hark back to the romantic episodes of Krishna in Hindu lore. From morning until night, the king was surrounded by his servants, his household, officers of the army, prelates of the church, and noblemen, all competing for favor. Primi Visconti described the scene. It is a beautiful sight to see him leave the chateau with his bodyguards his horses, his carriages, the courtier, valet, and a multitude of people, all in confusion, running about with much noise. It struck me that this was the queen of the bees when she leaves the hive with her escort. Louis lived his life in full view, like a court ceremony, making the events of the day seem theatrical in nature. One who saw him closely wrote, in public, the king is full of gravity and quite different than when he is in private. Finding myself in his chamber with other courtiers, I have noticed several times that if the door happened by chance to be opened or if he went out, he quickly composed his features and assumed another bearing, as if he were about to appear in a theater. In short, he knows how to play the king at all times. It would seem to me that he knew it was his hour on stage, and that he had a certain objectivity to his lower self, directing that self to take on what was necessary for the moment. His meals were elaborately staged by masters of ceremony, and the smallest detail took on great importance, from the presentation of his shirt in the morning to his candle at night. All of this bespeaks the mastery of the earth element and the immense detail of the Virgo hierarchy. Saint-Simon tells us, one needed merely to know the day and the hour to know exactly what the king was doing. It is difficult to appreciate the extent to which this regularity benefited his service, the brilliance of his court. Work and pleasure coexisted but rarely conflicted in the Sun King's life, for he kept them in separate compartments. It was his pattern to spend the day with his ministers, the evening with his courtier, and the night with his current mistress. He danced, played the guitar, attended dramatic performances, and held fete, lavish outdoor festivals, 
all without neglecting government, diplomacy, or war. During the first two decades of Louis's personal reign, there were hunting parties, boating trips, garden strolls, all supplemented by professional musicians, as well as ballets, balls, horse shows, pageants, contests, and tournaments of all sorts for every possible occasion. In the wintertime, the court would put on from one to three ballets a week, with everyone participating, including the king, whose favorite role was Apollo, and who danced with incredible agility and grace. In 1662, Louis held a famous horse show and tournament, which he turned into a masquerade pageant, as well as a display of skillful horsemanship and military maneuvers, involving the entire court. The first and largest troupe to perform was the Roman, led by Rex Romanet, Imperator, Louis himself, followed by the Persians, Turks, Indians, and American Indians, all elaborately costumed with great turbans and headgear, war clubs, ostrich plumes, and jewels. Maybe this was his own version of the United Nations. <laughs> or the portrayal of the assembling together of the seed of Sanat Kumara, who would be gathered together in the last days from the four winds. Well, it was so much fun that the whole show was repeated later in the summer with a similar cast of Romans, Muscovites, Moors, Persians, and Turks. The most famous party, perhaps even the, in the whole history of France, was a three-day festival held at Versailles in May of 1664, the Fete of the Enchanted Island. It was at this time that the site of Versailles seemed to first appeal to Louis, although he did not begin major remodeling until 1669 to 70, when it became his favorite project. Although Versailles is considered to be a monument of artistic accomplishment, Louis was criticized for the lavish expenditures on the palace, elaborate gardens and fountains, and for surrounding himself with so much grandeur and luxury when his people were so poor. But he loved to build and enjoyed gardens, so according to his upbringing, this was sufficient reason to justify the expense. It has been further explained that the thought would not have occurred to him not to decorate his palaces or care for his gardens simply because his people were poor. To him, the two were unrelated. He held in his heart the vision of the etheric cities and temples and the necessity of being the herald of the golden crystal age to come. I believe watching him then and watching him now in that role, that in his soul he believed himself to be the herald. He had the overpowering drive to crystallize the God flame, to set the archetypal pattern of the New Jerusalem as the fitting habitation for the reign of the Prince of Peace. He saw himself as the forerunner, the messenger of the Lord Christ, and held it his duty to externalize the culture of Venus. At no other time since the coming of Jesus Christ has there been a reign of a king in Western civilization that so outpictured the culture and the art of Venus. Rather than stand as his judge as history has so severely judged him, I prefer to ask the question, what was his assignment? What did Sanat Kumara send him to do? What did Lady Venus send him to do? I would like to ask the question as to whether or not he followed that inner guidance and divine plan, and whether that was the overpowering part of his life and all of the things that he did. I think that his consciousness was so vast, and so much of the things that we are considering are very much a part of the mark that I knew in this life that without a far-reaching examination of this embodiment, it is really difficult to draw conclusions because we realize that so much more was there to interplay besides what the world has seen. Versailles outpictured, as has not been done in all of Western civilization, the cult of the mother and the palace of light, with art, beauty, geometry, music, and the abundant life. In hierarchical order, he set the stage for the community of the Holy Spirit, 
which would by the law of correspondence conform to the inner blueprint, first etched in matter, and by the law of transcendence, supersede and surpass even the glory of Versailles. What he did in the externalization of the inner harmony of his causal body, he would bid us to internalize in the enchanted island of the heart. He made us know that it is possible because it exists in ultimate reality and because it has already been physical and tangible in his reign. To understand that it is possible to externalize the beauty of the etheric retreats in preparation for their lowering into physical manifestation. To realize that in some sense he was an archetype of an inner guru and those who surrounded him a sort of entourage of followers. And all of this, this civilization, this manifestation, might very well have been the testing of Western civilization to see whether or not it was ready for the further lowering into form of that light and that beauty, that realm. Subsequent events, perhaps mistakes of his own reign, that which occurred under the reign of Louis XV and the XVI, ultimately brought about the French Revolution. But this was more than a century after this moment of the building of Versailles. And therefore, to me, it is up to us to study, to contemplate, and to try to understand, trusting in the divine plan burgeoning within his soul. What was his assignment? And what part of it did he accomplish? And what of this assignment is ours to carry into the new age, into the light of Aquarius? Surely there are some things that we would not repeat, and surely there are some things we would not want to be without. With the violet flame and the resurrection and ascension flames, the Guru Chila relationship under the Sun King and all of their sigh is transmuted and resurrected into a higher, more exalting form. Their sigh is for us all a step and a stage in our collective externalization of the universal concept of community. I would like to read to you an interesting quote from the book Community. It has a very interesting statement to make about our community, which harks back to some of these points of Versailles. Without a doubt, I feel in my heart the quest for community in the heart of Louis XIV. This book on community set forth by El Moria makes an interesting statement. It has been repeated again and again, know how to find joy in eternal labor and in eternal vigilance. You have heard music and singing in our community. These must be looked upon as a part of the labor. Usually under the influence of sounds, people fall into psychic inaction and are even incapable of creating forms. This results from the custom of understanding repose as torpor. One can become accustomed to making use of art as a condensation of forces. A work of beauty can produce not only a heightening of activity, but also a sharpening of forces. But one should accept this fact consciously and learn to make use of emanations of creativeness. Could a structure of a community be conceived without crystals of sound and color? Verily, this would be a mole's hole. The bearers of sound and color must bring into the community an unspilled vessel. Knowledge and creativeness will be the amrita of the community. It is impossible to glut oneself with knowledge. Incalculable are the ascents of creativeness. In this infinity lies the stimulus of eternal labor. The worker may be saturated, and the watch is for him just the joy of conscious vigilance. 
One's being quivers in spirals of light, and light rings out. Indeed, creativeness is diffused throughout all labor, and some sparks of great ohm direct the current of life. That manifestation of creative power forms the nodes of evolution, and through it is fastened the thread of the mother of the world, fastened in a labor of eternal action. One need not smile at our language of the symbols of the East. The symbols embody a complex description of the properties of matter. We see no need of revoking a brief hieroglyph intelligible to hundreds of millions of people, the more so since these brief signs are beautiful. And you, people of the West, have the right to make from the lengthy also only the beautiful. Color and sound will be the amrita of the community. Knowledge will manifest an eternity of labor. Action surrounds great Om. There was perpetual labor in the life of Louis XIV. There was perpetual action. There was perpetual motion in his life. The fetes, the celebrations, the enactment of the goddesses, the portraying of the people, we find these in the etheric retreats as the angels portray archetypes of virtue and vice. There is something of the seventh ray in the fullness of its grandeur, its diplomacy, and its hierarchy in this man. I think then that we ought to study him even in greater depth than this lecture can probe and go beyond the human conditions of his life that perhaps are not agreeable to our way of thinking, either of government or in perhaps his having mistresses and so forth, and to probe the heart, the inner heart of the man, and to attempt to realize what flame of culture of the mother and the threads of the world mother he was holding and what place in our history he occupied with us for the carrying forward of this activity that we are engaged in. This party in 1664 turned Versailles into an island enchanted by the great magician Alcine who held the entire court captive by a magic spell for three days with pageants, tourneys, races, ballets, dances, dramatics, music, and abundant food for the courtiers who had been transformed into fauns, satyrs, gods and goddesses, knights and ladies for the occasion. While Louis often staged these grand festivals to entertain his mistresses, it should also be noted that he sometimes, he sometimes used them to disguise his intent in high politics. A lavish court affair covered the invasion of Franche-Comte in 1668 and the attack on the Spanish Netherlands in 1675 and again in 1678. So while Louis was willing to let Europe believe that he was concerned only with his own pleasure, his memoirs and letters reveal that he was often absent when the court enjoyed itself his ministers as well as his mistresses distracted his attention. In frequent consultation with his finance minister Colbert, he expanded industry and commerce and developed the French Navy, though the peasantry continued to bear the brunt of taxation. With Louvois, minister of war, he spent long hours laying the foundation of French military greatness always striving for French supremacy in foreign policy. In his continual pursuit of glory, he devoted much of his personal reign to territorial conquests and the waging of war. One of his first strategies was to use his marriage to Marie Therese as a pretext for the War of Devolution, or Queen's War, 1667 to 68 in which he laid claim to Spanish territory in the name of his Spanish wife. 
In an attempt to conquer Holland, he instigated the Dutch War, 1672 to 78, in which he acquired Franche Comté. His treasury then depleted, he devoted the next 10 years to annexing territories through aggressive political diplomacy, which caused Europe to retaliate by forming a defensive coalition, the League of Augsburg. In the subsequent War of the League of Augsburg, 1688 to 97, Louis lost minor territories, but French military power remained unbroken until the War of the Spanish Succession, 1701 to 14 which left France impoverished and disillusioned despite the fortitude and patriotism of its king. Louis had made it a rule never to be led, especially in politics, by any of the women who shared his life. He aspired to live by the advice he gave his son. A prince, he wrote, ought always to be a perfect model of virtue. It would be good that he avoid the follies common to the rest of mankind. Nonetheless, if it should happen that we fall in spite of ourselves into some of these errors, it is important at least to minimize the consequences. To observe the precautions that I have always practiced, the first is that the time we give to our love affairs must not prejudice our political affairs because our first object should always be the preservation of our gloire, our glory and authority. The second consideration, more delicate and more difficult, is that in abandoning our heart, we must preserve our mind, that we separate the tenderness of a lover from the resolutions of a sovereign, that the beauty who gives us pleasure never has the liberty to discuss our affairs nor the people who serve us. These two things must be separate. So he drew the line between business and pleasure and exercised that discipline in his own life and gave the advice to his son. To his closest advisers, he said, you are all of you my friends, whom I regard most in my realm and in whom I have the greatest confidence. I am young and women generally have considerable influence over those of my age. I enjoin you all, therefore, that should you see that a woman, whoever she may be, has acquired ascendancy over me in the smallest degree to appraise me immediately of the fact. I shall need only 48 hours to rid myself of her and to set your minds at rest. <laughs> Biographers, however, tend to view his reign after Mazarin's death as falling into three distinct periods based on his associations with women. The first being the chivalrous and romantic period inspired by Mademoiselle de la Valliere, the second being that of glory and conquest as represented in the person of Madame de Montespan, and the third period of general gloom and decline associated with the influence of Madame de Maintenon. You will notice that none of these three periods is dominated in the least by his wife. The Sun King's court during the first two decades of his personal rule has been described as one of amorous intrigue. Confessing that he could not remain faithful to his wife, Louis told his mother that his passions were stronger than his reason, that he could no longer resist their force, and that he did not even feel a wish to resist them. Confessing his passion to God only made it all the stronger. He was referring to Louise de la Valliere, a lady-in-waiting, to his sister-in-law Henriette of England, with whom he had also had a flirtation. Henriette had suggested that Louis pretend to be courting Louise in order to detract attention from their own relationship, but the plan backfired when Louis became enamored of Louise. <laughs> the pattern of the king's three main love affairs was always the same, the new mistress being provided unknowingly by the existing one. His love affair with Louise has been described as a pastoral idol. Louise was a shy country girl, very blonde and blue-eyed, slightly lame, and thought of as a blushing violet. Yet she was a skilled rider and marksman, and whenever possible, Louis would take her riding or hunting in the green wooded countryside. The king's infidelities caused his pious wife great torment, though he endeavored to treat her with respect and tenderness, especially at the beginning of their marriage. The story is told of how he held her hand, crying great tears of anguish while she was in the pain of delivery of their firstborn, the Grand Dauphin 
who would be the only one of their six children to survive to maturity. He usually took great pains to spare her feelings and one night at the age of 26, when he found her in tears in her place of prayer, where she spent much of her time, he was moved to compassion and promised her he would settle down and become a model husband at the age of 30. <laughs> well, we all have our tests, don't we? <laughs> Educated to desire to please God, Marie-Thérèse had difficulty adjusting to the ways of the French court and the delights that so entertained her contemporaries. Her apartment resembled a cloister, and in the first year of her marriage she received the habit of the Third Order of St. Francis and remained superior of the order throughout her life, often referring to herself as Sister Thérèse. At her death she was buried in her habit. Her naivete was a source of amusement for the court, for she was always the last to know of the infidelities of the king, whom she looked to after God as the object of her devotion. Her childlike mentality that believed everything it was told and looked to dwarf fools and little dogs as a source of entertainment separated her from the king, so the historians say. Her old-fashioned mode of dress and ineptness in the French language served to further separate her from Louis, who had such a distinct taste for style and an acute sensitivity to and appreciation for the delicate nu nuances of speech. In those days, the court followed the king wherever he went, even to wars. And to Marie Therese, who did not share his love of the outdoors and did not like to have her religious devotions disturbed, this was a great hardship. Furthermore, Louis would bring along his mistresses, sometimes riding in the same carriage. The death in 1666 of Louis's mother, Anne of Austria, who, like Mary Therese, devoted many hours to prayer and religious observances, proved to be both a shock and a liberation for the king. Some say that it was at this point that the real Louis began to emerge. Although he felt deep affection for his mother, and sobbed at her passing, he had been inhibited by the many strings, obligations, habits, and memories that had tied him to her, and especially by her painful disapproval of his liaison with Louise. Upon Anne's death, he officially recognized Louise de la Valliere as his mistress, made her a duchess, and legitimized their baby daughter, Marie Anne. It was also not until after her death that he felt free to proceed with his major plans for Versailles. La Valliere has come to be known as the saintly mistress, but at the time she was surrounded by those who wished her ill, from cliques of jealous ladies to scandalized clergymen. Bossuet, a clergyman discovered by Louis's mother, delivered a bold sermon on the Feast of the Assumption, which resulted in his three-year exile from court. Addressing the king, he thundered, I would tear from this heart all the pleasures that enchant it, all the creatures that capture it. O oh, creatures, shameful idols, leave this heart which wishes to love Jesus Christ. Upon this, he was banished for three years by Louis. Women were vying for the king even before his mother's death. As Primi put it, one should have some indulgence for this prince if he should fall, surrounded as he is by so many female devils, all seeking to tempt him. The worst are the families, fathers, mothers, even husbands, who push their women on him. The Duke of Angiens, in a letter to the Queen of Poland, said, There are a thousand intrigues at Versailles among the ladies. What agitates their hearts is envy of Mademoiselle de la Valliere. One of these who was determined to oust Louise de la Valliere was Madame de Montespan, famed for her wit and beauty, but also described as a flashing deadly serpent with the haughty carriage of an aristocrat. It has been said that what La Valliere lacked in brazenness to carry off the role of mistress, La Montespan did not. Laurier marked her when she first came to join the queen's household as one of the most ravishing, most wise, most charming of all the ladies at court, with an air so modest and so sweet that one would call her more angelic than human. Despite her charms, the king did not seem to notice or care for her at first, and reports vary as to when he first grew interested. 
She performed acts of piety and received communion every day to gain the confidence of the queen and befriended Louise in order to gain daily access to the king. Yet according to some stories, she remained unsuccessful in attracting the king's attention until she visited Madame Voisin, a fashionable fortune teller who then performed spells possibly involving satanic rite, after which the king seemed to notice her for the first time. It was not long thereafter that the court learned that the king had a new mistress, but this time all of Europe was scandalized, for it was double adultery, as both the king and La Montespan had spouses. Louise eventually entered a convent where she imposed heavy penances and fasting upon herself in atonement for her sins, and the king continued his passionate involvement with La Montespan, which would last for 12 years, producing seven children, the governess of which would one day become his second wife. By the ninth year, the court was wondering how La Montespan managed to keep the king's favor, for he still seemed captivated by her despite her ill humor. Although he strayed now and then to other attractive faces in the court, for the most part he remained faithful to her until in 1678, Mademoiselle de Fontage arrived at court with the express intention of becoming the king's mistress. It was not long before she was occupying an apartment next to the king's cabinet, provoking the jealousy of La Montespan. La Fontage eventually gave birth to a stillborn child and died herself shortly thereafter, leaving the king greatly shaken. In this discussion, we're entering into the realization of the opposition to the bringing forth of the light of the inner retreats, the opposition to the office of king, the office of guru, the office of light bearer. We realize that far more is at stake than mere amorous involvements with women at the court. Here we see the description of serpent types, the seed of serpent, of the fallen ones, and a veritable conspiracy against him to prevent the full lowering into manifestation of the divine plan. This was mounting, and it was very apparent to the queen herself, who was there in actuality to keep the flame against this horrendous conspiracy of darkness. Now the conspiracy obviously moved against him, and obviously he had an opening into his own being, which is the opening that all of us must understand and then stand, face, and conquer. We realize that this encounter with the allure, the misuse of the white fire chakra of the mother by black magic, witchcraft, and Satanism is something that every chila on the path must face. As we look upon this, we either are shocked or we understand. We understand in the light of our own embodiment now and in many past incarnations. We see Mark a saint and a holy brother, a devotee of Christ, and we see him in a lifetime coming to grips with all of the Nephilim of the planetary body. Here, he must stand, face, and conquer. And it is obvious that by personal experience and involvement, he learned much of the wisdom that he had in his final incarnation. We need to understand that many of us have learned in the very same way by direct encounter with the Nephilim and all of their conspiracies to entrap us, and the most powerful of which, of course, has always been through the magnetic attraction of sex itself. This went on during his reign, and as we go through it with him and see just how far this went, we realize how deadly it was. It was so deadly that it finally took the life of the queen. And so it has a very dark side and a very light side. It represents the struggles of someone like us who went through these episodes. We must consider them in all seriousness that this has been the frontal attack on the sons of God, the daughters of God, and the members of the Great White Brotherhood since time immemorial. If we do not get past this point and see through it, we do not succeed on the path of the ascension. Fortunate are we 
that our own beloved guru lived a life so entirely public that there was not a detail of his existence that was not recorded. And therefore, we could study how he dealt with the entire circumstance and see how his momentums of purity in previous lifetimes and subsequent lifetimes, and even his purity in this one, saw him through to the overcoming of the darkest of darkness, surely, that there ever was. At this time, then, we see reports of poisonings, sorcery, black, mas black masses, and magic scandalizing Paris and the entire kingdom. Chief among the accused had been La Voisin, the Paris fortune teller who was found guilty and burned to death. Among her other crimes, it is said that she performed at least 2,000 abortions and sacrificed live babies to the devil. La Voisin's accomplices, Bertrand and the valet Romani, both confessed that there had been a plot to poison the king by means of a petition which was to have been presented to him at Saint-Germain, and a plot to poison Mademoiselle de Fontage by contaminating her clothes and gloves. These reports were confirmed by their friend, La Filastre. A priest had also been arrested, Guy Bourg, former sacristan of the church of Saint Marcel, who admitted to having celebrated black masses at La Voisin's request. Her name means the neighbor. In other words, the woman next door. There is massive evidence that shows that these black masses sacrificing live babies to Satan were performed to control the life of the king, to control his relationship to the queen, to his mistresses, in politics, in war, in everything that he did. Realizing then, for instance, what we said today, that even the preaching of the prophet has no effect upon one who is under such a spell. We have to come to grips with our own state of consciousness, our own positioning on the path, and the decisions we make. And we have to realize that we must always determine that we are free from psychotronics, from hate and hate creation, from witchcraft, from manipulation, from projections of every kind. Sooner or later, these projections are always an attempt to entrap the individual in one more sexual encounter, one more affair, that is not the fusion of the soul with the bridegroom, who is Christ. And we realize that the enslavement of light bearers upon earth has been going on for tens of thousands of years at the hand of the Nephilim on this point of the cross, this very line. After La Voisin's execution, her daughter Marguerite Montvoisin testified that Madame de Montespan, the king's mistress, had been one of her mother's long-term clients. The following is the summary of her testimony as recorded by La Reine, chief of police. From 1667, Madame de Montespan was in the hands of La, La Voisin, who had already collaborated with Mariette, a priest of saint Savarin, then aged 28, in making spells for her to win the king's good graces and to harm Mademoiselle de la Valliere. She had Mariette and other priests pass certain love powders under the chalice, the chalice in the church. Le Sage, a fortune teller who specialized in answering messages addressed to the devil, came to Paris and stayed with Voisin. Believing him capable of black magic, she introduced him to Madame de Montespan, and he promised to achieve what she wanted. La Voisin, Le Sage, and Mariette, with others in the same business, paid several visits to several different places for this purpose. Le Sage and Mariette quarreled with La Voisin and left her house. After that, Montespan saw them everywhere. Mariette and Le Sage went to Saint-Germain at the beginning of 1668, and among other things they did was to go to the room of Madame de Thiang, the sister of Madame de Montespan, where Mariette, wearing his surplice and stole, his priestly garb, sprinkled holy water and said the gospel of the kings on Montespan's head, while Le Sage burned incense and Montespan recited a spell written for her by Le Sage and Mariette. 
The king's name was in the spell, also that of Madame de Montespan and Mademoiselle de la Vallière. This spell has not been preserved, but another spell cited in the trial invokes Ashtaroth and Asmodeus, princes of friendship. These names hark right back to the list of names in the Necronomicon of the Nephilim gods. The purpose of the spell was to obtain the good graces of the king and to make Mademoiselle de la Vallière die, though Mariette says it was only to make her go away. Montespan then gave them as Saint-Germain two pigeons' hearts for which they had asked. These two hearts were given to Mariette so that he could say mass over them and pass them under the chalice, the communion chalice. This mass on the two hearts was said by Mariette in a chapel of the church of Saint-Severin, and Madame de Montespan was present. The sage said that the pigeons' hearts were put under the chalice while Mariette denied this and claimed that he had merely put them in his pocket while saying mass. The point of saying the mass in the church is to use the prayers of the people, the momentum of light, the focus of the body and blood of Christ in an inverted form in black magic to therefore control and manipulate the life force, the heart chakra, the entire comings and goings of the king. After the Mass, Madame de Montespan went to Mariette's room, where he repeated the ceremonies and spells performed at Saint-Germain. The same ceremonies and spells were repeated two or three times in the same place. The Sage says that he added other ceremonies with human bones to procure Mademoiselle de la Vallière's death, while Mariette denies that and says that Montespan did not ask him to procure Vallière's death, only to make her go away. After all these ceremonies on Montespan's last visit to Mariette's room, he and Lesage, in Montespan's presence, placed in a little gilt vermilion box specially brought by her, the two pigeons' hearts given them at Saint-Germain for the Mass said in Saint-Severin. The written spell, the gospel of the kings, some words of a church hymn, a star made by Lesage, and a small consecrated host. Mariette says that if Lesage put in a host, he, Mariette, knew nothing about it. Lesage, on the other hand, says that Mariette provided the host and put it in the box, and that he carried it on his person and made the spell on his own account. After that, Madame de Montespan once again went to find Lesage at the house of the woman named Duverger, where he lodged, and there, with an altar and lighted candles, Mariette and Lesage said, the Veni Creator on Montespan's head. Even more serious charges followed. For several years, it appeared, Madame de Montespan had added aphrodisiacs without his knowledge to the king's food and drink. She had also tried to kill her rival, the young Mademoiselle de Fontage, either by impregnating her clothes with such poisons as arsenic, red sulfur, yellow sulfur, and orpiment, or her gloves with a decoction of peach blossom. The third charge was made by a friend and accomplice of La Voisin, a 70-year-old abbe named Guibourg, ugly, blind in one eye, and totally depraved. It was Guibourg's horrible practice to say black mass on the body of a naked woman. In the early 1670s, when the Montespan was still struggling against La Vallière, he confessed that he had bought a stillborn child for the price of one écu in order to celebrate a black mass in the presence of Madame de Montespan perhaps, though he did not specify this, actually on her naked body. He pierced the baby's throat with a knife and caught the blood in the chalice. A first mass was celebrated with the baby's blood. During a second mass, the baby's heart and entrails were consecrated in order to make powders for Madame de Montespan. One can see and hear the screaming of the absolute envy of the fallen ones of the purity of the heart of Lanello. One can see that this 12-year alliance with Montespan could easily have been intensified by aphrodisiacs, which he would take in daily. Thus, the whole world has judged him in this light. And whether or not we are to judge remains the work of each one's conscience. Marguerite Monvoisin, the daughter, gave the following statement regarding Guy Bourg. I saw Guy Bourg say two masses in my mother's bedroom. The first took place, as far as I can remember, more than six years ago. 
I helped my mother to get the room ready for this mass. A mattress was placed over a row of seats and candlesticks with lighted candles in them were placed on stools on each side. After this, Guy Borg would emerge from the small side room wearing his chaussouble, and then my mother would bring into the room the woman on whose belly mass was to be celebrated. At that point, my mother made me leave the room. When I was older, my mother came to trust me, and I was present at that kind of mass, and saw that the lady was stretched naked on the mattress with her head thrown back at one end, supported by a pillow placed on a chair which had been turned on its side, and her legs hanging down at the other end with a napkin spread over her belly and a crucifix placed in its center, and the chalice was set on her groin. Madame de Montespan had one of these kinds of mass said for her by the Abbe Guibourg at my mother's house about three years ago, and she came at 10 in the evening and did not leave until midnight. I heard my mother tell the lady that she should let her know the dates on which they could say the other two masses which had to be said if the affair was to succeed. But the lady told her she could not possibly find the time and that they would have to perform the remaining ceremonies designed to make the affair succeed without her presence. My mother promised to take Madame de Montespan's place for the remaining two masses and have the rituals performed on her own body. Some time after that, I was present at a mass which Guiborg celebrated in the same manner on my mother's stomach, and at the elevation of the host, he repeated the name of Louis de Bourbon and that of the lady, which consisted of two or three names which did not include that of Montespan. On several occasions, I delivered to Madame de Montespan on my mother's orders powders which had previously been sprinkled into the chalice and other powders of whose composition and usage I know nothing, because when I asked what I was to say when handing them over, my mother told me to say nothing because all had already been said. Once I saw her concoct a preparation, and it consisted of powdered moles. Finally, Marguerite Montvoisin declared that Mademoiselle des Oyers a maid of Madame de Montespan's had often come to collect powders of this sort for her mistress. She also mentioned a petition which was to, present, which was to be presented to the king at Saint-Germain, the sole purpose being to poison the king by means of this petition. The historian Cronin records this final accusation as follows. The fourth charge was that Madame de Montespan had impregnated with arsenic or some other poison a petition to the king, asking him to pardon a friend of La Voisin, who was serving a prison sentence. Madame de Montespan had lent her carriage to take the petition to Saint-Germain. In short, driven by frenzied jealousy, she had gone as far as to try to kill the king. Such were the accusations made before the secret commission, the verbatim proceedings of which were at once conveyed to the king. From the nature of the witnesses who testified before the commission, a certain amount of lying was expected, and according to some reports, La Boisin's daughter had never actually seen La Montespan. Nevertheless, the judges were convinced that the bulk of the events and actions described in the proceedings had really taken place. Earlier biographers and historians seemed to tentatively accept or affirm Madame de Montespan's guilt, but most research done after 1908 seems to defend her innocence. Though evidence would indicate that she had tried spells and aphrodisiacs to influence the king, her alleged involvement in the poison conspiracy was never conclusively proven, and she was never brought to trial. When Louis received the report that his mistress' name was being repeatedly implicated, he ordered the Chambre de l'Arsenal to suspend its sessions and to burn its dossiers. It is often noted that her accusers were men and women of the vilest sort who had plotted against her to thereby escape trial themselves. When the Chambre closed its doors in 1682, La Reynie, chief of police, had documented 210 sittings, 319 warrants for arrest, 318 actual arrests, 88 condemnations in what has come to be known as the Affair des Poisons, the Affair of Poisons. It is unclear as to whether or not Louis himself believed the evidence against Madame de Montespan, but the entire episode seemed to produce a change in his life marking the end of the age of gallantry. He felt a need for someone with whom he could talk and was drawn more and more to the prudent widow whom La Montespan had employed as governess for their illegitimate children, Madame de Maintenon. She was viewed by her contemporaries as being virtuous but austere, somewhat of a Calvinist, though a devout Catholic, 
dutiful but critical of society, and somewhat cold. She was unique among most of the ladies of the king's court in that she apparently declined to be his lover. An observer noted, she has introduced him to a new land heretofore unknown to him, which is friendly intercourse and conversation without restraint or chicanery. He seems charmed by it. He began to spend hours in her apartments, but at the same time followed her advice to become more attentive and faithful to his wife, the queen. Hence it is recorded that after 1681 he surrendered his gallant behavior and to all outward appearances returned to the queen, bringing happiness to her last years. In the summer of 1683, when only 45, Queen Marie Therese fell ill of an abscess under her arm. Rather than draining it, her physician had her bled, which according to some reports drove the infection inward and upon the added administration of an emetic killed her. The Princess Palatine believed that Fagon, the queen's physician, purposely contrived the death in order to promote the interests of Madame de Maintenon. Surprised at his wife's death, Louis remarked that it was the only grief that she had ever caused him. He had begun to appreciate the sincere affection she had borne him, notwithstanding his unfaithfulness. The court went into full violet mourning, and a new chapter opened in the king's life. He was free again to marry and could choose a foreign princess or one of the great ladies of his court. Yet he chose Madame de Maintenon, whose influence had been credited with his reform. This entire affair of the poisons, this burden on the king, was a burden on the entire court. All of us who were tied to Louis XIV at that time, all of France, all of Europe, and the world. It was the direct practice of Satanism through the use of newborn babies in these black masses against his life. In my awareness, the queen had the awareness of exactly what was going on, became a part of the Order of Francis by her own soul's inclination to that life and attempted to keep the flame for him was murdered by her physicians so that they and the entire uh, episode of Satanism was not exposed and in fact overcome. She was the witness and the keeper of the flame of the protection, whatever protection he might have. The marriage with which followed was a happy marriage and yet it also spelled the decline of his reign, which of course came after the death of the wife who had spent her life in prayer for him and recognized beyond the surface that he indeed was the incarnate guru. Although the marriage was kept a secret, evidence suggests that it, it occurred in June 1684 when Louis was 45 and Madame de Maintenon 48, a marriage that would endure some 32 years. They were never far from one another, and Madame de Maintenon came to have considerable influence over the king's private life and possibly an indirect effect on public affairs, especially after 1700, when much of the business of state was conducted in her presence. It is said that the king never again fell into promiscuity, and life at the court was described by Princess Palatine as more boring than any other place in the world. Louis encouraged his new wife to take an interest in the education of young ladies as an outlet for some of her energy and intelligence, and thus they founded the school at Saint-Cyr for the education of young women of good birth but small prospects. In later years, he began to turn to her more and more for consultation, appreciating her calm approach to problems and her obvious concern for his interests, as well as her clear vision and articulate speech. To the last decade and a half of his life, Louis began to experience the frustration of failure, defeat, and humiliation, as well as remorse and concern for his soul. Toward the end of the War of the Spanish Succession, Madame de Maintenon wrote, When the king returns from the hunt, he comes to my apartments, he closes the door, and no one enters any more. There I am alone with him. It is necessary to soothe his troubles if he has, if he has them, his sadness, his vapeurs. Sometimes he weeps tears that he cannot control. 
the uncontrollable tears which have no explanation in our lives are often the grief, the deep-seated soul grief of what we know to be going on at inner levels, but what is not apparent to us in the outer. Thus he had an intense grief that had to do with his ongoing relationship with the Brotherhood. He had raised France to, his, to its highest pinnacle in the first half of his reign, but now in the second half he witnessed the destruction of much of the fruit. The turning point had occurred around the middle of the 1680s. In 1684, at the time of the truce of Radisson, Louis was at the summit of his royal career, admired by his subjects as Louis le Grand, a standing model and menace to the other nations of Europe. Since 1679, Louis had concentrated his efforts in the area of diplomacy, but nevertheless had maintained an immense army as an intimidating force behind his ventures, successfully annexing the territories necessary to firm his frontiers. He had managed to induce Strasbourg and Casale into acknowledging him as sovereign, and on August 15, 1684, in the Truce of Ratisbon, Spain provisionally recognized his conquests in the Spanish Netherlands. An alliance with the Elector of Cologne virtually extended French power to the Rhine, the fulfillment of a long-desired goal to reach natural boundaries. This was the zenith of the Sun King, not since Charlemagne had France been so extended or so powerful. Even amid its destitution, the populace idolized its ruler, taking pride in his apparent invincibility, while foreigners praised him for the geographic logic of his campaigns. It has been noted that though his private life may have been disorderly at this time, order prevailed in the state, both at home and abroad. By 1685, his private life was beginning to be orderly, but disorder was beginning to rock the state, with each event leading the nation further on a downward course from the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 through the War of the League of Augsburg in 1689. The huge national debt resulting from many years of war greatly burdened the realm and continued to be a problem during the reigns of his descendants, Louis XV and Louis XVI. Though France was almost entirely an agricultural country, production decreased sharply and thieves and bread riots were rampant. The population had fallen by one-fifth in half a century due to war casualties, widespread starvation, and the expulsion of Huguenots through the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which has been considered the biggest blunder of his reign. The Edict of Nantes had been promulgated in 1598 by Henry IV of France to grant religious and political freedom to the French Huguenots, who were Calvinist Protestants. Henry IV had declared it irrevocable, but Louis felt that the Huguenots should return to the Catholic faith, not only because it was the true religion, but because their monarch commanded it. To Louis, there could be no exception to the rule, one king, one faith, one law. When the edict was revoked, many thousands of Huguenots fled to the safety of Protestant countries, causing a great economic loss to France and a dearth of skilled artisans. Those who were caught escaping were persecuted and martyred. Louis's last years were further darkened by a series of tragic deaths of close relatives, beginning with his son, the Grand Dauphin, who died of smallpox in 1711. Although the Dauphin had never quite measured up to Louis's expectations, his grandchildren had provided a source of hope for the future and a bright spot in the king's life. But they too were to be stricken by epidemic and accident. The Duke of Burgundy, his wife, and their five-year-old son, all very dear to the king, died from measles. Then the king received news of the death of a granddaughter-in-law, the Queen of Spain. A close grandson, the Duke of Berry, passed on from a hunting accident. A newly born great-great-grandson died a few weeks after Louis had sent joyful birth announcements throughout the kingdom and prayers of thanksgiving from every cathedral. It seems to be a very major illustration of the loss of the one keeper of the flame, as all of this now rides in as the continuing action of that original practice of black magic and witchcraft. 
which may very well have continued and probably did considering the amount of people who were accused and arrested in his realm. Louis was left with no other consolation than his faith in God, and yet he was certain that all that had happened to him was God's judgment. Now this is a very interesting self-assessment on the part of the king, because it is exactly what the fallen ones would have every one of us believe, that because we sin or err or are not perfect in our ways, that the calamity which then follows in our lives is superstitiously, therefore, the condemnation of Almighty God. And therefore, by our own sin and sense of shame, we have the open door to accept any and every calamity. And this is the open door to the very condemnation of the fallen ones practiced against us, even to the point of the blood rituals of satanic rite. So you see the very challenging of this criticism, condemnation, and judgment, the very vigil of the flame, the very vigil of his own twin flame, might have neutralized many of these events. We realize then that in this situation, as in our own lives, we have a very great need to follow the path outlined by us by the great karmic board in working with our twin flame in making certain that every day all of our calls include a silent prayer even when we are in the sanctuary for the protection and upholding of the divine counterpart. And if the divine counterpart be ascended, we still pray for the divine mission of that one on earth because it is through us that the ascended master can act and work and speak. And therefore we are yet accountable for the protecting of the name and the image of our ascended guru that his projects and plans might appear and not be opposed by the same black magic which opposed him in life. One of the most important teachings I received in this embodiment from El Moria, as well as in these previous embodiments, is that no matter what comes to pass, we always hold the immaculate concept for our twin flame, for our guru, and for our fellow chilas on the path. There is no other way to keep the flame than to go beyond the ups and downs and the comings and goings of the outer person and to center ourselves solidly on the fire of the heart and on the soul and to know that our dedication is to uphold the individual until, as it says, death us do part. Until God himself shall remove us one from the other, we uphold each other. And if it cause us pain, if it cause us burden, then that becomes our own test, our own understanding of our own self-mastery on the path, our own discipline, and we can find many, many lessons in our own reactions to these events which teach us just how much farther we need to go on the path of our own self-mastery. This then brings us to the point of our own arrival of responsibility and accountability for many parts of life. You can see that the indomitable will of keeping the flame has resulted in my own heart of keeping the flame not merely for the king, but for all of the ones for whom he holds the key to the incarnation of God. And I have recognized through long, long centuries of the experience of curses put against the royal houses of Europe and you'll read about the curse against the Habsburg family. That much darkness has come upon these families. And in the midst of all of this, the light bearer, the one who is emerging, the one who is on stage, you, the chila of the ascended master, needs absolute support, absolute daily decree, unswerving devotion from my heart, that immaculate vision of you locked in to your Christ self. So fraught is this life and this world with these sorts of dangers. And you have no idea today what sort of invisible or astral forces may be moving against you in your attempt to be a chila. And you see how quickly, in the sincerity and humility of your own heart, you will accept guilt and self-condemnation. I did this terrible thing, so now I am suffering the punishment. When you may have long ago balanced that sin, or God forgave you on the instant, and you are here to keep a flame, but the fallen ones are moving intensely against your light. 
So you see, in the full fervor of the desire for penance under the Lord God and forgiveness of sin, we must not allow that privacy and that intimacy of our oneness with God to be invaded with the accuser, the Nephilim himself, who will come in, invade our prayer chamber, invade the secrets of our hearts and our personal confessions to the Lord God and say, you did this terrible thing, now you must suffer. So this is the predicament in which we find Louis XIV. He is accepting all of this without challenge, without asking the Blessed Virgin or Archangel Michael to rout the fallen ones, to turn back the curses of Satan, scarcely any knowledge of the science of the spoken word. And therefore, all this pitted against him, he sits now with that momentum of condemnation, which is the open door to his own demise. He had always shown interest and concern for his children and grandchildren, including his illegitimate offspring, which he had legitimatized and arranged marriages for in order to assure them status in the kingdom. He had done everything to save his grandchildren, even ordering the opening of the coffin of St. Genevieve for intercession and asking for hundreds of masses and public prayers. He wrote, God punishes me, I have merited it, and I will suffer less in the next world. Perhaps he spoke truth, perhaps he did not. What is most important is that if we are going to bear our karma with dignity, we do not allow the fallen ones and their black magic to ride in upon that karma and to accept death as the judgment of God. Louis XIV died September 1, 1715, four days before his 77th birthday. He had reigned as King of France for 73 years, the longest reign in the history of Europe. His reign marked the apex of the monarchical concept in government, setting the pattern for all the kings of Europe. His palace at Versailles set a standard in architecture as well as inspiring a universal appreciation of beauty and culture. It was a golden age for the arts. Poets, playwrights, philosophers, and men of science flourished, and the age of reason, science, and liberty came into full swing. Louis ruled France in one of its most brilliant periods, inspiring all of Europe to a new standard of culture and lifestyle. He was the head of a dynasty which could be traced back to Charlemagne and which was considered to be the most eminent in the world. He dared to pursue a policy of greatness and prestige in every field, which demanded an efficient and effective administration, as well as adequate resources, both military and financial. He imposed unity on a nation weary of internal strife. The details of political and administrative functions, religion, society, protection of the dynasty, and dominion abroad all came under his personal supervision. He was the very personification of France to his subjects, who had lived for so long under Louis XIV that only the most aged could remember when a different king sat on the throne. Many of the splendid administrative systems which evolved in subsequent reigns germinated during the time of Louis. The registry office, the postal service, and the highway department would one day set the example for others. The great efforts during Louis's administration for centralization of government and unification of French law paved the way for the great legislators and unifiers of the 18th century. Yet as one recent historian wrote, no sovereign has been criticized and vilified as much as Louis XIV. That particular point is one of which we take determined note. We realize that that criticism and that condemnation and that judgment of history upon him, justified or not justified, is not only a burden upon him to this hour in his ability to interact with all of his chilas in the world, but it is a burden upon us and upon our community. And it is a damnation of the fallen ones who point the finger while they themselves engage in their own betrayal of the light. 
And as Louis Bertrand wrote, it is indeed disgraceful that France should appear to disown such a glorious figure as Louis XIV, that she should not understand and appreciate the man who not only bequeathed her her place in the modern world, but who even made her what she is today, from the line of her frontiers to the workings of her administrative system. Louis left behind him a France that was territorially larger, militarily better defended and more effectively administrated, as well as a glorious culture that would dominate the Age of Enlightenment for years to come. He is remembered by some as the most competent ruler in modern Europe, by others as a pompous blunderer, and still others as no great king but the best actor of royalty that the world has ever seen. He has been the object of the extremes of adoration and hatred. But in the words of Voltaire, his name can never be pronounced without respect and without summoning the image of an eternally memorable age. I would like to hear now some of the court fanfare that we heard when we began this lecture. I must tell you that my response to this music is the leaping of my heart and my soul exclaiming, the king is coming. I know that is how we felt when we heard that fanfare at Versailles. After considering this life once again, as I have considered it in the course of studying European history, I wrote down these words that I'd like to read to you. Mark is just that kind of a humble soul who allows us to peer through the window of his very private affairs so that through him we can appreciate the full gamut of human weal and woe. He lets us see him in all his humanness and in the glory of Christ the king, and he is unabashed about playing either role. Both are natural, both are necessary to the evolution of the total man. This necessity for the evolution of man is something that we must all understand. Sometimes I have souls who come to me Sheila's on the path, very concerned, 
that they desire to confess to me the episodes of their lives. And when they have finished telling their stories, very often I will say, well, you did this and this because it must have been necessary. Necessary to your understanding, necessary to your evolution, necessary so that you could experience that full cup and then come to the place where you could surrender it. I think it is important that we learn this lesson from our guru. As I wrote, Mark is to us today what he is because he entered life in its fullest dimensions with ultimate enthusiasm and a desire to give and receive all that life on earth had to offer, only to surrender it, to surrender it all, and transcend the matrix for a higher goal. Having drunk the full cup and quenched his thirst for the matter of compliment, he could well afford to set it aside and move on in the grand scheme of the Creator and his perpetual recreation within ourselves as Christ is formed and then reformed within us. Our greatest challenge as his chilas is to learn from his experience without either the necessity to condemn or to similarly indulge ourselves in his lesser cycles but to seize the billowing mantle of his soul, now the Ascended Master Lanello, and ride the higher cycles he has entered. It is ours to understand, to forgive, and to move with him in ever new worlds to conquer. Mark never hid any human imperfection from me. He did not hide it in this life. He did not hide it in any of the lives that we have talked about. Sometimes historians tend to make us more the saint than we are and more the sinner that we are. There is a very important place we come to on the path. We receive the forgiveness of the guru. Then we are given the opportunity to see the imperfection, the humanness, or the weakness that may express at any time in the life of the guru. The role is reversed, and we are given the opportunity to forgive. It is a major test. If passed, the law is fulfilled. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I came to the understanding in the study of this life that it is absolutely necessary for every guru to unveil imperfection, in fact, to perhaps indulge in it for the very purpose of the testing of the chilas. This is a slice of the life of Louis XIV. There is much, much more. Volumes and libraries. It suffices me to know that it is Kuan Yin's quarter and that world forgiveness must be invoked before the full causal body of the Sun King can be outpictured. I believe that there is much there that we must have at the inner retreat. The crystal, the art, the sound, the music, the perpetual motion, the sacred labor, his expertise in administration, which has laid the foundation of this organization, and all of his probing of all of the areas of life. I think there is much unreleased for the very fact that he was not a full-orbed messenger at that time. He did not use the science of the spoken word as much as we are given to understand. So I think there was a blocking of the full flowering of France and the full victory in the decline of his life. And inevitably, that decline 
continued through the 15th and the 16th, and finally, the end of the opportunity for this system of government to ever bring France again to the height of achievement or nobility. So it is an interesting episode in history, and I think it is one which needs healing in all of us. I know that as Mark himself considered his life as Louis XIV, he would rather it had never had been, because he had great sense of remorse and burden in this life for the sins of that life. And I try to bring him the consolation and the realization of the perspective that I'm giving to you, to liberate him from the sense of burden which I knew to be the burden of millions of people who were then present and who have considered that life and who have condemned it, and also the burden of the entire episodes of Satanism surrounding the court. So you see that even today, the Ascended Masters look to their chilas for the redemption of each of their embodiments. And it is the ideal moment to invoke the intercession of Kuan Yin on the burden of this entire affair on any and all of us and all light bearers throughout the world and especially the light bearers in France. And you know there has been a block. We do not have a teaching center in France to this day, and yet Mark and I have spent many embodiments there. So if you will allow me, I would like to make an invocation of clearance and exorcism on these records that I have read as you yourself ponder your own oneness with your mighty I Am Presence and Lanello. In the name of the I Am that I Am, beloved mighty I Am Presence of all, Beloved Christ, self of all, beloved Anello, we call to your magnanimous heart. We call to the entire spirit of the great white brotherhood. We invoke the violet flame from the altar of Kuan Yin, the very heart of the Lady of Mercy and the Bodhisattva of love. Beloved Kuan Yin, we call to you. We call to you in the name of Anello for intercession in this hour for an intense outpouring of mercy, forgiveness, and the violet flame. We call for the intense action of the fiery salamanders. We call to beloved and mighty Estrella. We call now for the binding of the cause and core of the condition of consciousness of La Voisin. We demand the binding of that life stream, mortal cursing, all cause, effect, or record and memory of the practice of Satanism in France from the beginning unto this very hour, passing through the reign of the French kings and interfering with the outpicturing of the divine plan of Louis the 14th, 15th, and 16th, and all who are a part of that court. I demand the action of the sacred fire. Bind oh, now those records. Let there be the redemption through the Blessed Virgin, through beloved Saint Francis, through the Brothers of Light, through the great karmic board and the mighty archangels. Let there be the purging fire. Let there be the transmutation. Let there be the binding of the yoke of rebellion, of disobedience, stubbornness, and defiance of the law among the French people, going back now to the misuse of the light and ultimately to the curses of Satanism practiced upon that nation knowingly and unknowingly by the core of the dark ones. Burn right through and liberate the children of the light in France, the sons of God, the reincarnate souls of the seed of Sanat Kumara. Burn right through, I am demanding in this hour the liberation of all of France, of the burden imposed by any and all mistakes ever made by Louis the Fourteenth or any of our own incarnations, including Mary Therese and Marie Antoinette and Clovy and Clotilde and all of those manifestations of the incarnations of the light, beginning with Sir Lancelot. Burn right through, blaze the light of 10,000 suns, blaze the light of our own causal bodies. I call for the tracing now of every incarnation in France by every keeper of the flame, every member of this activity. Burn right through and let there be the consuming now of all compromise with the great cosmic law 
burn right through and let there be the reclaiming of the light of the sacred fire and the Holy Virgin, all misuses of the light of the sacred fire. Burn right through in the name of the living word. I call for the mighty action of the sacred fire. I call for the full power of the great central sun magnet. I call for the full power of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I call for the communion of our beloved Saint Germain for the purging of France. Bind then the witchcraft and black magic that causes or may cause the rebellious attitude of the French and especially the manifestation now of the preponderance of communism and socialism in the government. Burn right through, blaze through, mighty astray, and circle the government of Francois Mitterrand and all those predecessors. Burn right through with the full power of the sacred fire breath, beloved mighty astray and the mighty elm of God. I demand the purging of that nation and the raising up of the flame of liberty from the heart of the goddess of liberty and the heart of beloved Paul the Venetian. I call for dispensations of light from the heart of beloved Saint Germain and Portia, the heart of beloved Kuan Yin. I call to the great causal body of Lanello and our, our own causal bodies of light. Now for the transmutation, now for the purging, now for the binding. I call for the transmutation of that entire reign. I demand the resting of the spirals of all world condemnation upon it. I demand the lifting of the judgment of the fallen ones, and I say, let the judgment of Almighty God and of his own hand and his own Son be upon us, and therefore let there be the transmutation of all manifestations of karma, and let the fallen ones be rolled back, and let their own judgment of the sons of God be upon their own heads. Therefore we accept the judgment of God and his judgment only, and let the world and mass consciousness be bound. Let it be bound in the name of the living word. Let all those who have ever been deprived of the light of God that never fails through any acts known or unknown, taken by any ascended master, including Lanello, any unascended Sheila, including everyone present, and all who will hear this lecture, now be redeemed before the Lord God Almighty. Let there be the binding of all that is not of the light. Let there be the release and let there be the action of mighty gifts of our causal body unto all and any who may have ever been wronged by us in any reign, under any kingdom, under any condition whatsoever. We call for the magnificent light from the heart of Kuan Yin, the full gathered momentum of the violet flame, to be present now with our students here and those throughout the world who are celebrating the coming of Kuan Yin. Let it be a Kuan Yin jubilee of light. Let there be a liberation of hearts and souls. Let there be a liberation by the power of the violet flame. We call it forth in the name of the word. We decree it in the name of the word. We call forth the confirmation of this call by our own beloved Lanello here and now. We call for the redemption of his name, of his song, and of his heart. Beloved Lanello, we invoke the fullness of your mighty causal body of light all seven bands and the secret rays and the white fire core of Alpha and Omega to be out pictured at the inner retreat through our life streams. We offer ourselves heart, head, and hand that we might go forth in the full manifestation of the science of the spoken word to defeat all black magic and witchcraft practiced against this ultimate and fulfilling endeavor to bring to pass thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We call in the name of Jesus Christ for the lowering of the etheric temples of light and the inner cities into manifestation by the direct hand of the great white brotherhood and we that demand the binding of all Satanism, black magic and witchcraft interfering with the necessary supply and abundance. We demand the binding of all interference with the coming of the sons of God into this divine plan. We demand the binding of all interference of all those who have been kept from our community in every other incarnation. We say clear the way, clear the highway of our God and let all of the activity of the dynamic decrees of the saints upon earth be for the fulfillment of this invocation of light. We decree it in the name of the Blessed Virgin, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of every saint on earth and in heaven, and especially in the name of your own dear heart, beloved Lanello, in the name of the light of God that never fails, we invoke the magnificent mercy flame in your name, in the name of the law of forgiveness, on behalf of the twin flames of the ascended masters and the ascended masters themselves for all past incarnations. We invoke it on behalf of those present here, their twin flames, and all to whom they are karmically tied. Let there be the rebuking of the seed of serpent that has ever sought to control the children of the light through the misuse of the life force. Let that witchcraft be bound. Let every curse on every family that we have ever been apart be broken now by the mighty action of the rod of Aaron, by the mighty action of the Kundalini fire, by the Maha Kali, by the Maha Chohan, by every ascended master of the great white brotherhood. In the name of Brahma Vishnu and Shiva, in the name of Brahma Vishnu and Shiva, 
in the name of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, in the name of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, we call it forth from the heart of Brahman. O sacred word of God, manifest here. I demand the breaking of the back of the cursings on the royal houses of the sons of God throughout Europe, including the Bourbons and the Habsburgs, and all others known or unknown. Let them be broken, O God, in thy name. In the name of mighty victory, we decree it. We summon the hosts of the Lord, and we accept it on this hour in full power. Amen. Do we have the recording for 224, Love's Victory? We'll sing that then. This is Lanello's choice. Lanello sings to you the victor as we sing to him the victor. the glorious day, strawberries of victory along the conqueror's way. Yoke the muses to his car, let them sing his trophy won, while his mother's joyous star shall light the triumph on. Hail to love, to mighty love, let spirits sing around, while the hill of Mighty love resound. Or should a sigh of sorrow steal amid the sounds thus echoed for? Twill but teach the God to feel his victories no more. See his wings like amethyst of sunny in their
We'll but teach the God to be his faithful.